Hey guys, this is Alt Shift X. Let's talk about Tyrion Lannister. Uh, we just released this gigantic uh, hour long feature length bloody documentary all about Tyrion. And unbelievably, there are still a lot of things to say about Tyrion. Uh, I got a whole bunch more stuff that didn't quite fit in the video. Um, or that just could do with a little more discussion. So I'm going to talk through a whole bunch of stuff that didn't make it into the video that I think is interesting. And I'd also like to answer whatever questions you guys have about Tyrion. Um, so you can chuck them in the live chat and I'll try and get to as many as I can. Um, so... I mean, first of all, like, Tyrion is obviously a ridiculously complicated and layered character. And I think in a lot of ways he's the main character of A Song of Ice and Fire. Tyrion has the most chapters from his point of view of any character in the series. Uh, the author, George Martin, has said that Tyrion is his favorite character. And while, like, Jon and Daenerys are very much like the ice and fire, they embody the magical fantasy elements of the story... I think Tyrion embodies the human heart of the story. Um, and especially with his relationships with Tywin and with Shay and Taisha. Like, I think that that really is, in a lot of ways, like the emotional core of A Song of Ice and Fire. And so, so and Tyrion's story, like, interconnects and overlaps with so many other storylines. Um, with Jon, with Daenerys, with Aegon and young Griff, with Jon Con. Uh, and so that's part of why Tyrion's story is so important and so complicated and part of why uh, we made such an enormous video about it. So this live stream uh, will, I think we'll put an edited version of this live stream on the Alt Shift X podcast. So make sure you're subscribed to the Alt Shift X podcast. There's a link in the description. Um, and let's just talk about it. I want, I want to shout out Bella Burgholtz. The artist Bella Burgholtz. This picture of Tyrion you see here uh, is by Bella Burgholtz, commissioned for this video, which was really exciting. Um, and you can see here the the process, uh, the, like the multiple versions that Bella created uh, of the Tyrion artwork as we went along. Um, this was like the initial draft, and I thought, ah, you know, it should probably look a bit younger, more neutral expression. And then this. Tyrion is just kind of, like, way too hot to be Tyrion. Like, it looks beautiful, but Tyrion needed to be uglier, so then we created this version, and, and ultimately this final version, and also the noseless version. So I was really excited um, to have that work by Bella. And also and also a really cool piece uh, of Nurse by uh, Radraz26 was commissioned for this video, so that was really exciting. Um, and while we're talking about, like, Tyrion's appearance, I want to talk about Tyrion's hair colour. Because uh, it's a bit of like a controversy. It's a bit of a storm in a teacup. It's, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about Tyrion's hair colour. Because, uh, you know, Tyrion in the show, you know, he's Peter Dinklage. He's got dark hair. Uh, Tyrion in the books is described as having pale blonde hair. But some people disagree. Um, there's a lot of artwork, if you look at artwork of Tyrion online, where Tyrion has a mixture of pale blonde and black hair. Um, stuff like this by Sherb's Art, Salt to the Sea, Fairy Candy. And it looks really interesting. Like, I think this is a really interesting character design with the, with the long streaks of black hair in with the blonde. I think that's cool. But I don't think that's what is described in the books, because Tyrion's hair colour is described uh, about four times throughout the entire series. He's described as blonde. He's described as having flaxen hair. He is described as having a fall of hair so pale... Uh, a fall of hair so blonde it seemed white, or pale blonde that it seemed white. And there's also one little line in book five uh, that says that plastered to Tyrion's brow are uh, hairs, uh, are strands of blonde and black hair. So there is one line in the fifth book that mentions Tyrion having strands of black hair. And I think because of that, on the Song of Ice and Fire wiki, 
Someone wrote under the Tyrion's appearance section on the wiki that Tyrion has, quote, a mixture of blonde and black hair. And I think it's because of that line on the wiki article that so many artists have drawn Tyrion like this with with a mixture of pale blonde and black hair, even though uh, that's not really what's described in the books. In the books, he's overwhelmingly described as just being blonde. Um... There is that one mention of, of, of pale blonde, of, of black strands. So in this artwork by Bella, we do have some subtle black strands of hair in here. Um, because I think that is the most reasonable interpretation of what it says in the book. But I, I just think it's really interesting, just as like a story of like internet errata, um, that, that this happened, that one line on the wiki got turned into this interpretation online. Um, and of course, you know, if people want to draw Tyrion that way, they can draw Tyrion that way. Like, you know, that's cool. That's fine. Um, but I just think that's interesting. Anyway, so, so like in, so, so I'll go sort of like in sequence, like in the order that we tackle things in the video. Um, so in the video, we talk about how Tyrion is very ugly compared to Tyrion in the show. Uh, and George Martin has been inspired by the story of Richard III, who was a historical king of England, uh, who was... Uh, after his death, said to be very ugly and villainous uh, in a similar way to Tyrion. And, and something that I didn't mention in the video that is just really cool is that Peter Dinklage, who plays Tyrion in Game of Thrones, played Richard III in a theatre production of the, of the Shakespeare play Richard III, which is one of like the defining stories um, that, that has made out Richard to be this ugly villain. Uh, and so I just think it's this, and this is years before Game of Thrones, so I think it's so beautiful, uh, like uh, as a coincidence, just beautiful serendipity that that Peter Dinklage, who play, who would later play Tyrion, played Richard the Third, who inspired Tyrion. That, that's just gorgeous. Um, so I almost regret not mentioning that in the video, actually. So yeah, that's cool. Um, thanks for the super chat from Toto ninety five, who says, "Oh no, not you! I thought this was an Alt Swift X video. I am out of here." Uh, the last Tyrion video was great. Oh man, we're not going to tolerate any Alt Shift X fanboying over in this stream. This is Alt Shift only. Um, so yeah, Tyrion, Richard III. Um, and, and one of the other things that like I, I would have liked to go into a little more depth about was was like the, the circumstances of Tyrion's birth and like the reason why he was hated so much. Because um, we talk about how, like, you know, King Aerys, like, made fun of Tywin for the birth of Tyrion and said that, you know, the gods were punishing Tywin for his arrogance um, and the small folk called him Lord Tywin's doom. Um, but, like, an additional detail here, so something that Oberyn talks about in Book 3, is that when Tyrion was born, the common people, the peasants, the small folk, they said that Tyrion's birth was a bad omen that foretold famine and plague and war and winter. Um, so, like, in superstitious Westeros, the birth of, an, of a dwarf, especially in, you know, a, an important noble family like House Lannister, was seen as, like, you know, a sign from God that, like, disaster is coming. Um, so, so that's, like, you know, one of the specific beliefs and one of the specific reasons why Tyrion's birth was seen as such a negative thing and reflecting so poorly on House Lannister and on the, the king and, and the government and the whole sort of, like, you know, because, like, monarchy, like, like historically in a lot of cultures is seen as, you know, God has chosen this family or this person to be king um, and God might send signs uh, to indicate uh, that God is no longer happy with the king and that the king is no longer legitimate. Uh, that's something that we talk about in the disaster and religion video that we did a while ago. Uh, we did a non-fiction video on Alt Shift X, and I think it's one of our best videos. Um, so if you haven't seen the disaster and religion video on Alt Shift X, I think you should, because it's pretty cool. And it talks about a lot of this stuff, about how disaster is connected to religious ideas and political ideas, um, which is super relevant. Another thing that we didn't mention in the video is that, like, like, like we list a bunch of Tyrion's terrible uh, failures in the TV show. 
So we like we like list some of Tyrion's failures because Tyr because Tyrion like the whole second half of the TV show all he does is fail miserably. Um, he fails in Marine. He fails with war. He fails with Cersei. He fails with uh, Daenerys. Um, but like specifically, like w with the whole like trying to make peace with Cersei. Like I don't know if people remember, but like that whole plot line. Um, the, the the plan was that. Daenerys wanted to make peace with Cersei, or Tyrion convinced Daenerys to make peace with Cersei instead of destroying her, in order to give them time and the resources to go and fight the White Walkers. Um, and in order to convince Cersei to make peace and not to attack them, Tyrion suggested this this bloody white hunt plan. Like that whole thing where like John and the boys go up to the north, they capture a zombie, they get stuck, they camp overnight with the White Walkers surrounding them, and then Daenerys flies from Dragonstone to the north, then back south again, and like that that whole ludicrous fucking farce in season seven, episode six. That was suggested by Tyrion. That was his grand plan. And it resulted in in them bringing a white down to King's Landing to Cersei. And Cersei's like, oh, that's a bit spooky. You've got a fucking bloke in a Halloween costume. All right. And then she lies and says, okay, I'll make peace. But it was a lie. And at the start of season eight, she... Well, I mean, nothing really comes of it, which is true of almost all the, the harebrained plot lines in the later TV show. But my, but my point is that one of the most egregious and ridiculous and smooth smooth-brained plot lines in the Game of Thrones TV show was Tyrion's plan. Um, so that just adds to the list of just 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 dumb stuff that Tyrion is responsible for uh, in the TV show. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Peter, who says, Do you think Dinklage's performance caused the showrunners to shift gears with Tyrion, or was it just a narrative decision for TV? Adore the channel. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, Tyr like, the actors' performances definitely did influence the showrunners' decisions about, like, what to do with the characters. An example of that is Shay. Um, like, Sybil Kakeli, uh, her performance, the, the showrunners really enjoyed, and that was part of why they made Shay into a very different character and a more complicated and a more sympathetic character than she is in the books. I, I think that Shay is a, definitely a better character, a, a more interesting character in the TV show than the books. In the books, Shay is very one note. Like, all she is is she just wants gold. Um, and nice clothes and social status and she doesn't care about Tyrion and that's kind of it. Whereas in, the, whereas in the show you get to see Shay's feelings for Tyrion uh, become more complicated and more layered um, and she does end up betraying him but she has like sort of more complicated reasons for doing so and more complicated feelings. Um, like her, her betrayal of Tyrion is more meaningful because she does have some real feelings for Tyrion, I think. Um, so yeah, like the active performances do change the way... Um, characters were written in the TV show. And I think that that's likely true of Tyrion as well, because Peter Dinklage obviously does an incredible performance of Tyrion. Um, like, even when the writing of Tyrion and Tyr Tyrion's character arc becomes a car crash in the second half of the show, Tyrion is still extremely watchable. And you can see that the showrunners are leaning on that hard. Like, if you actually look at how much dialogue is in the final episodes of Game of Thrones, especially the final episode, there are like whole long stretches, like 10 minutes when there's no dialogue at all, there's no speaking, because I think that writers realized that writing dialogue was maybe not what they were really very good at. It wasn't the strength of the later seasons of Game of Thrones. The strength of the later seasons of Game of Thrones was the performance by the actors, because no matter how bad the writing got, Peter Dinklage, Lena Headey, Nikolai Costa Waldo, all those actors fucking kill it. No matter how bad the writing gets, those actors are still eminently watchable. I, I could watch Peter Dinklage act all day, no matter how bad the writing is, I think, to a certain extent. Um, and, I mean, to answer your question, I, I do think, yes, that it's possible that since Peter Dinklage was such a fan favorite and so beloved, you know, they didn't want to have Peter Dinklage play the horrible, murderous rapist who Tyrion becomes in book five. Like, like, uh, like th there was already a lot of criticism about sexual violence in Game of Thrones and Tyrion's sexual violence that he commits um, and all his threats of rape and his actual rape and just his constant despicable behavior. Um, I can totally see why the showrunners wouldn't have wanted beloved actor Peter Dinklage to play out this horrific, horrible 
uh, performance, especially given that there's no ending to that character arc in the books. Um, so I, th I can see why the showrunners decided to just not make Tyrion into that monster and instead make him stay as a more sympathetic character. I think that that totally neutered his storyline, um, but I can see why they chose to do that. I, I, I've said it before. I think the showrunners were in an extremely difficult situation trying to write an ending to the TV show when no ending existed in the books. So yeah, like it, it was a real difficult situation. Thanks for the super chat from Hay. Thanks for the super chat from Talon who says, assuming you know who they are, who do you agree with more, Preston Jacobs or the Order of the Green Hand? If not, you should give the Order a look. Yeah, so Preston Jacobs and the Order of the Green Hand are uh, Song of Ice and Fire YouTube channels and both of them are known for having some unorthodox ideas, some some theories and some interpretations that are quite different to how most people interpret the story. Um, and I haven't seen enough of either of their videos to have like a strong opinion on who's best. I, I have seen like some of both their videos and I, I've seen both of those channels say stuff that I think is really interesting. Um, and some interpretations that I think are, are really cool and, and possibly true. I've also seen both of those channels say things that I think is um, not true or not a great interpretation of the books, but yeah, I I'm not going to like sit here and evaluate who's, who's right and who's not. Uh, thanks for the super chat from PB Duckin in a Vox Pop. That is a hell of a name. Who says, can you explain how and why exactly Tyrion is a time traveling fetus? So this is one of the more notorious uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones theories. Uh, there is this idea that Tyrion is a time traveling fetus. I, I believe that the theory is uh, that, so, so, so like, you know, remember Rhaegar? Rem remember when Daenerys was pregnant um, and she was gonna have a baby, but then uh, the witch Miriam Asdur like cursed Daenerys. And so instead of giving birth to a healthy baby, she gave birth to a, strange deformed creature with the wings of a dragon which disintegrated into grave worms and and was never born properly there's a theory that well actually uh the baby <laughs> the baby didn't die like that because we never actually see the baby's body so maybe it didn't actually die like that maybe what actually happened is that when marie mazdeur performed that magic um on daenerys while on daenerys's tent while she was giving birth she actually sent daenerys's uh, fetus or like i mean you know baby uh back in time and space through time and space into the womb of joanna lannister uh meaning that Tyrion is not the son of tywin lannister and is not the son of Aerys targaryen but is actually the son of Khal drogo uh and so Tyrion is a targaryen but not of Aerys from daenerys Aerys is actually his grandfather then i suppose and i think people may you know the the wings are like you know targaryen blood and, and also like when Tyrion was born there were rumors that he had a, a tail um among other weird appearances um so maybe that tail was part of this whole sort of draconic dragon targaryen appearance and, and you know if, if you say that a time traveling fetus is is too ridiculous to be believed um w I, I i disagree because we we have seen time travel shenanigans when bran walks into hodor's mind in the past with the whole hodor willis situation in season six which uh, George Martin has suggested will happen in the books as well. So time travel does exist in A Song of Ice and Fire. Therefore, it is not completely crazy. It is completely crazy. It's not completely crazy to think that Tyrion is a time traveling fetus, son of Daenerys and Drogo, and therefore the stallion who mounts the world. So, you know, when Tyrion joins Daenerys on her conquest of Westeros, maybe that will fulfill the prophecy of the stallion who mounts the world. Um, why not? Uh, thanks for the super chat from Son Goku, who says, small man, make a funny word set, kingdom, get angry. I believe that's a reference to a recent Alt Swift X video called Thing Big, Thing Small. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Father Paprika, who says, what are your thoughts on Tyrion's little running joke about the brothel? Thanks for staying awesome. Looking forward to a Clash of Kings when you can spare time. Uh, so yeah, so, so something we mentioned in the Tyrion video is that the last line the last line of dialogue in all of Game of Thrones, unbelievably, is Tyrion saying, I once brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel. Um, because that is a joke that he started telling in season one, when Tyrion was in the Eyrie, in the Vale, and he was 
talking smack and entertaining the crowd uh, in front of in front of Lady Lysa. And he started telling this joke, but but Lysa interrupted him before he could finish it. Uh, and so ever since 2011, when season one came out, people have been speculating about what what is the answer uh, to this joke. And there are online, there's a bunch of like potential punchlines to what this what this what the punchline of this joke might be. Um, and uh, you know, m- m- maybe some of them are what the showrunners had in mind, but I don't think there's any like official answer. Like I think that ultimately like. Giving it an answer would not be as satisfying as leaving the mystery open and ambiguous, you know? And, I, and you know, tangent, but I sort of feel the same way about the whole Tyrion Targaryen theory. Like, personally, I kind of, ha- I, I kind of hate the idea that Tyrion is a Targaryen because the Tyrion-Tywin relationship is so perfect as it is. Um, uh, but the whole flying a dragon thing and the dragon dreams and like there are some pretty strong hints that Tyrion has some kind of kind of connection with dragons which kind of requires Targaryen blood um I- I'm rambling but I-, I don't think there is an answer to that joke or to that mystery that would be satisfying and I think ambiguity is sometimes the right choice uh perhaps both with this joke and with some of the mysteries in the books Thanks for the super chat from Ernesto, who says, can you speak a bit about Tyrion's relationship with Varys? Thanks for your content. Tyrion is my favorite character. Yeah, so that is something that we didn't cover much in uh, the video. Uh, Because Tyrion does have a relationship with Varys. Um, It's sort of, it's like, like later in the TV show, it becomes a friendship. Um, but I wouldn't say that Tyrion and Varys are quite friends in the books. Uh, Varys helps Tyrion hide Shay, uh, but he also kind of threatens Shay by saying that, like, you know, hey, like, you know, I know, I know she's here, and like, he sort of hints that he will reveal Shay to Tywin and get her killed if Tyrion sort of goes against him. And of course, ultimately, you know, Varys testifies against Tyrion uh, in his trial. Um, I, I think mostly the, the Tyrion Varys relationship is an excuse for George Martin to, you know, have them discuss the themes about power. Like it's with Tyrion and Varys that that Varys says that power is a shadow on the wall. It's a mummer's trick, which subtly hints at the uh, young Griff Aegon plotline, uh, because you know Aegon is Varys's mummer's dragon. Aegon is Varys's shadow on the wall. Aegon is Varys's uh, shadow puppet. He, he, his sort of fake constructed image of power and legitimacy that Varys is using to sort of um, get political control over 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 Westeros and to install a ruler, uh, which is a whole other a whole other rabbit hole. Um, so yeah, like I, I don't I didn't feel there was all that much to say about Varys and Tyrion's relationship. I, I mean, in terms of like specifically what Varys Varys's plans are, like it's Varys who sends Tyrion to Illyrio. Um, after Tyrion kills Tywin. Um, and so you can, you can speculate that throughout book two and book three, Varys is watching Tyrion, uh, and observing his political plots and his machinations. And he's decided that, okay, like Tyrion is a smart guy. He might be useful for, uh, my conspiracy with Illyrio to put Aegon Targaryen and Daenerys on the throne of Westeros. Um, just like Varys... Uh, got Barristan Selmy to go and join Daenerys. And Tyrek Lannister has been tucked away, probably by Varys, uh, for use in his conspiracy and his, and his play for the throne. So uh, so I think that, that, that Varys sort of, you know, picked up Tyrion as a potentially useful player. And of course, Tyrion is uh, the heir to Castle Rock. And so Varys could perhaps choose to install Tyrion as the Lord of Castle Rock. Uh, and Tyrek is perhaps a, a backup there. Um... So, yeah, I think it's interesting how Varys observes Tyrion throughout book two and three without helping him entirely. Because Varys could have helped Tyrion more, uh, but chose not to. Uh, and so perhaps in some way Varys orchestrated Tyrion's downfall, you could say. I mean, it's it's interesting that there's a quote by George Martin. Author George Martin talked about uh, the whole tywin Shay situation. Uh, like, how, like, how did Shay end up in Tywin's bed? And author George Martin said that, well, you know, Tywin was aware that that Shay was around and that Shay was the 
um, was the camp follower who, who Tyrion met on the Green Fork. Uh, and George says, quote, as to precisely what happened here, that there, there's something that's something I don't want to talk about because there's still aspects of it I haven't revealed that will be that will be revealed in later books. But the role of Varys is also something to be considered. So, which sort of hints, as I interpret it, that perhaps perhaps Varys put Shay in Tywin's bed, uh, uh, by which I mean maybe like Varys uh, suggested that, hey, Tywin, you should take this woman as your bed warmer. Like, you know, th this was Tyrion's, uh, this was Tyrion's whore. You could take it as your own. Maybe, maybe, Tyr maybe Varys sort of set that up um, in order to deliberately get Tyrion to be angry at Tywin and to kill Tywin. But because that's the thing, like, like when Tyrion goes to kill Tywin, Varys says, hey, Tyrion, uh, you know, Jamie's helping to free you. Come with me to the ship uh, and don't go after Tywin. And Tyrion's like, nah, I want to go and kill Tywin. And Varys is like, oh, no, don't kill, go, don't go and tell Tywin. But here are the exact directions to Tywin's room. Uh, climb this many rungs on the ladder and go down this tunnel. Like, like Varys gives Tyrion specific directions to tell him how to go and kill Tywin. Like he says, oh, don't kill Tywin. But he give, he tells him how to go kill Tywin. So we can infer that, that Varys wanted Tyrion to kill Tywin. Um, and so you've got to wonder, well, are there maybe other ways in which Varys orchestrated and influenced and encouraged strife between Tyrion and Tywin and wanted Tyrion to kill Tywin and, and mani was manipulating Tyrion to turn him against the Lannisters to get him to help the Targaryens. And George has said that, you know, we, we might learn more about this later on. So, yeah, I, so, so those are some of the things that are, that are going on in uh, Tyrion's relationship with Varys. Uh, thanks for the question, Ernesto. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Gabriel, who says, I find that part in the fifth book where Tyrion becomes a slave along with Jorah and Penny to be a very strange vibe. Were some soldiers testing some kind of firearms on slaves? Yeah, so... It is a whole sort of odd thing that happens when when Tyrion and Jorah and Penny become slaves, um, which is something that they sort of did in the TV show for about five minutes. Um, but but it, it is sort of a longer thing in the books. Um, and as you say, Gabriel, there is like a moment where um, the, the, the overseer nurse forces Tyrion and Jorah and Penny to watch as the Yunkish soldiers test out their, their weaponry of the Tolosi slingers. Just to test out their weapons, they tie up slaves to a post and they fling these, these, these heavy metal balls to break the bones of these slaves. And it's just this horrific, dehumanizing, awful, awful thing that happens. And so there is a bit a bit of time that's spent on showing how slaves are horrifically mistreated and, and Tyrion witnesses that and suffers a, a, a small part of that. Um, and it's interesting Tyrion's reaction to seeing that suffering. Like later on, he like chats to some slaves and he thinks that like, oh, you know, some some slaves actually like being slaves. Um, they prefer to be slaves. Um, uh, and it's not that different to Westerosi feudalism, really. Like being a peasant in Westeros is not that different to being a slave in Slaver's Bay. And, 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 and Tyrion, you know, it's not like he feels a lot of sympathy for these people. Tyrion is quite detached and he, and he sort of thinks in a sort of a Tywin mindset, comparing himself to Tywin at this point. So I don't know. It, it's all, it, he doesn't really take a strong sort of stance Either way, like, he doesn't go, wow, slavery is evil. I should help Daenerys break the chains. Like, ooh, the slavery sucks. But he's also not, like, totally without sympathy. Like, he's nice to Penny, at least. Um, so, you know, uh, so, so I didn't really say all that much about it in the video because it's not that sort of conclusive. Like, like uh, Tyrion's storyline in A Dance with Dragons is weird because... Uh, George Martin, when he was writing A Dance with Dragons, he almost included the Battle of Fire, the, the, the battle for Marine between Daenerys and the Yunkish soldiers. He almost included that and the Battle of Ice between Stannis and the Boltons in Winterfell. Like there was a lot of this stuff that was going to be included at the end of The Winds of Winter, but George Martin decided not to. And he cut it from, uh, sorry, A Dance with Dragons. It was going to be included at the end of A Dance with Dragons, but George Martin changed his mind and cut that stuff out of A Dance with Dragons and decided to put it at the start of The Winds of Winter instead, which is weird because, like, the Battle of Fire and the Battle of Ice are, like, the climaxes of A Dance with Dragons. So A Dance with Dragons is kind of a book without a climax. It's a very long book. It's a very long book full of build-up 
with no climax, which, you know, it's, it's, it's the narrative equivalent of blue balls. And since we've been waiting 10 years for the next book to come out, that, it's been a decade of blue balls for A Song of Ice and Fire fans. Um, so it's a weird choice. Um, and, and I feel like in the same way that, you know, we don't get the resolution to the, to the battle of the Battle of Fire, we also don't get the resolution to Tyrion's character arc. Like, by the end of A Dance of Dragons, Tyrion does seem to be turning more towards violence and brutality and revenge by killing Nurse and by thinking about Tywin. But it's not conclusive, you know? And I, and, I, and I wonder if maybe at the start of The Winds of Winter with the Battle of Fire, we will finally get that sort of resolution with maybe Tyrion finally rejecting Penny for good and embracing fire and blood, you know? Or maybe that'll be an ongoing thing in The Winds of Winter. It, it, it's just, it's really hard to to be conclusive about what Tyrion's story means because Tyrion's story is so very incomplete. Thanks for the super chat from Nono who says, I think the show didn't finish the story. King Bran isn't the end. Tyrion's arc of regret would start after being made hand to his, to a dystopian magic king. Yeah, that's a cool image. Um, because, you know, Bran being king is weird. I, I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> Bran being king is weird. Um, it, it, it was surprising to a lot of people and it was sort of hard to know what it meant. Like, what is the meaning of King Bran being king? Like, Tyrion tells everyone that, oh, who has a better story than Bran Stark? But no one at that council meeting that selects Bran as king knows Bran's story. <laughs> we, the viewers, hardly know what Bran's story is. What, what, what is the Three-Eyed Raven? What does Bran know? What does Bran want? What are Bran's values? What is Aragorn's tax policy? There is there is so little information about what Bran as king means thematically or like specifically or politically. It, it's such a, a weird black box. In the books, I, I think Bran being king is going to be something a lot spookier because Blood Raven, uh, the Three-Eyed Raven, is something a lot spookier and a lot more dark and evil. He he's, he probably feeds Bran the corpse of Jojen. There's all this crazy dark stuff that goes on. Um, and, and so I think that Bran as king might be something more sinister. I think that Bran might be a puppet of the old gods or of Bloodraven. Um, uh, he might be a creepy god king like the emperor on the Golden Throne in 40k or like uh, Dune. There's a lot of like dark possibilities with Bran being king. And so if, as you say, no, no, if Tyrion becomes Hand of the King to fucking tree sorcerer dark wizard man Bran, that would be a weird ending. Like, would Tyrion want to be Hand of the King to this crazy evil sorcerer? Um, would Tyrion want to rebel against him? I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that, honestly, to me, is an argument against uh, Tyrion being Hand of the King in the books. Um, cause like, yeah, the more, I, I, you've kind of convinced me that it would be really fucking weird for Tyrion to be Hand of the King for Bran because, I mean, Tyrion does have like a bit of a relationship with Bran in the books because he gave Bran that saddle design and maybe that relationship could be developed further, uh, when there's the fight against the White Walkers and I think Tyrion will like join up with the Starks to some extent, um, with Jon Snow at least, um, and something that we'll talk about later is that in the original 1993 outline that George Martin wrote of A Song of Ice and Fire, Tyrion was going to leave the Lannisters and join the Starks and help the Starks. So perhaps in the books there will be more of a relationship that builds up between Tyrion and Bran, and maybe that'll make Tyrion being Hand of the King to King Bran, maybe that'll make more sense after that relationship builds up. Because they sort of tried to do that in, like, one scene in Game of Thrones Season 8. Like, Tyrion had a chat with Bran, except we don't get to hear anything that they say to each other. The scene just cuts right before the interesting bit, which is one of the most annoying things that the show repeatedly did uh, in Season 8, is that, like, right, right as the scene starts getting interesting, the scene ends because the showrunners just couldn't think of how to write the dialogue, I suppose. It's like that when uh, the Starks get told that Jon is a secret Targaryen, the scene ends before we get to see their reactions. And it's like it, cowardly writing. Um, 
so yeah, I don't know. Interesting point. No, no. It'll be interesting to see like like what it'll be like if Tyrion becomes hand to Bran. Thanks for the super chat from Lang, who says, "Do you uh, would you prefer the TV show ending with the White Walkers taking over King's Landing, killing everyone, only being able to accomplish this because everyone betrays each other in the last battle?" Yeah, I, I think that could be a thematically appropriate ending to A Song of Ice and Fire, like. Because, like, one of the messages throughout the story is that everyone's obsession with politics and power is a distraction from what really matters, which is life and death. Um, And that's why it's so lovely that in the TV show, the Iron Throne gets destroyed in the end. Like, one of the few things that I really liked about the ending of the show was the destruction of the Iron Throne, which I think something similar absolutely has to happen in... Uh, the books. And I think that when Bran becomes king, uh, there's a lot of theories that he'll become king on the Isle of Faces, uh, which is a place with lots of weirwood trees, and it's connected to the magic of the old gods, which is what Bran's connected to. So, you know, if if Bran becomes king in the books, and it it seems as though he will, he will probably become a very different kind of king. And that's something that the show didn't explore enough, but um, Bran might become more of a sort of a mystical Fisher King, magical, wagical sort of a dude, rather than you know, an Iron Throne sort of a king. Um, What was the question? So, yeah, like, I I think that because of that message about politics being a distraction from from the real battle between between good and evil, I agree that if the White Walkers killed everyone, that would be, like, the ultimate argument of you done goof. And I I think that's especially relevant to Tyrion. Because Tyrion, especially throughout book two, is totally obsessed with his personal petty vengeance and with his relationship with Tywin and his family and with uh, keeping the Lannisters on the Iron Throne and political power. And he repeatedly ignores the Night's Watch. Uh, he, he does give some men to the Night's Watch at one point, uh, but he mostly ignores uh, the, the White Walkers, even though he sort of knows deep in the back of his head that, oh, this is like a real thing. The White Walkers are a real problem. Um, so... What's the point? The point is that it would make sense for Tyrion's story specifically if he suffers uh, as a result of his ignoring um, the White Walkers. And I think that Tyrion playing a role in the battle against the White Walkers would be a good way to, like, resolve and address uh, his ignoring the White Walkers for the rest of the books. Like, in the TV show, Tyrion doesn't do anything during the battle against the White Walkers. He just hides in the crypts and he, like, kills one White Walker with dragonglass to protect the women and children in the crypts. Um, but he doesn't really do much or contribute much. And, and I think that he will do more in the books. Uh, and I'm sort of 50-50 on whether he'll ride a dragon in the battle for the White Walkers. Like, I, I think it's very likely that Tyrion will ride a dragon at least once. Um, but he might not become like a Targaryen dragon rider like Daenerys and like Tyrion. I, I think that it makes a lot of sense if his dragon Viserion gets killed or taken by Euron. And so he be- sort of becomes this sort of ambiguous half Lannister, half Targaryen, like is he Targaryen or not? I really like that ambiguity. So I, I tend to think that's probably what will happen there. Thanks for the super chat from Apocalypsegon, who says, it does, uh, Apaca, not Alpaca, Apaca. What could Tyrion have done during his time as Hand to quell the conflict? Wasn't his father the one waging war in which he couldn't do anything? Yeah, that's a good point. Like, like one of the criticisms that we make of Tyrion in the Tyrion video is that he his, his work to help the Lannisters, like, like he's taking the side of the bad guys, basically. By helping the Lannisters fight against the Starks, he, he's helping the bad guys who aren't the legitimate government and who are more cruel and violent than the Starks are. Um, but you could argue that, well, Tyrion didn't have much of a choice. Um, it, it's like Tyrion could not stop Tywin from waging war on the Starks. Tyrion could not convince Tywin not to be brutal. I think that's true. Um, so it's not really his fault that Tywin does that. But I mean, it, it's still Tyrion. Tyrion chose to do everything he could to help the Lannisters keep power. I mean, if Tyrion wanted to, he could have betrayed the Lannisters and helped Stannis take King's Landing, you know? Or Tyrion could have absconded. He could have just left Westeros, gone across the Narrow Sea, like, just just gone into the east. Like, you know, I, I, I agree that Tyrion probably couldn't have done much to stop Tywin and, and to stop the War of the Five Kings. Like, I think that was probably not in Tyrion's power. But he could have betrayed the Lannisters and helped Stannis, the rightful king, take the throne. He also could have assassinated Joffrey. And interestingly, that is something that wa- that was originally George Martin's plan. In the 1993 outline that George Martin wrote, he planned for Tyrion to kill Joffrey. For real. Not, not just to be accused for it. Um, so, 
yeah, like, I agree that, like, it, it, it wasn't an easy situation for Tyrion, and he probably couldn't stop Tywin from doing what he was doing. But I think that Tyrion could, could have not actively helped the Lannisters commit their atrocities and helped them keep power. He, he was helping to prop up. Like, like, if Tyrion allowed Cersei to take more influence and power in King's Landing, Cersei could have led to the self-destruction of House Lannister a lot earlier than she does. Because she does do that in Book 4. Like, that, that's kind of the sad- like, that's another sad thing, is that, like, Tyrion tries so hard to help the Lannisters. Uh, but the Lannisters just collapse in the end, partly because he kills Tywin, but also because when Cersei takes over, she just runs House Lannister into the ground. So, um... So yeah, it's a difficult situation that Tyrion was in, but but I feel that he he should have not fought to help the Lannisters. He he should have fucking left or changed sides. And yeah, that's a really hard thing to do, go against your family. But his family hated him, you know. So you know, it, it, Tyrion's complicated, and the reason why he's such a good character is that it's possible to have so many different opinions and interpretations. Um, it, it is complicated. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Ravi, who says, do you think there's any connection between the old gods and Tyrion's visions? Thanks again for the great in-depth content. I mean, Tyrion doesn't have a lot of visions. He does have a dream where he has two heads and he fights a battle and then he cries. And he does have um, dreams of dragons. And it's not really clear if those dreams are like magical dreams or if they're just regular dreams. Um, so, so Tyrion doesn't have all that many visions. Like, like Jaime has visions. Um, John and Daenerys have lots of visions. Uh, Tyrion has has fewer like visions and and dreams compared to other characters, and I think that indicates that he's less connected to the magical side of things um, compared to other characters. So I I don't I don't see a connection between Tyrion and the old gods. No, but but something that we will talk about is that something that's really interesting that was in the books that wasn't in the show, uh, which we didn't mention in the video. Uh, is that, that there are a couple of occasions when Tyrion gets attacked by the Stark direwolves. There's like at least like two or three times when when he gets like like roughed up by the Stark direwolves um, for no like apparent reason. Uh, like like Ghost sort of knocks over Tyrion because Tyrion was like angering Jon and Ghost is connected to, to Jon's emotions. Uh, and there's this moment where, where Tyrion comes to Winterfell and, and Rob is being sort of hostile to Tyrion. And then Grey Wind and Summer and Shaggy Dog all like attack Tyrion and rip his clothes. Um, which is really interesting. Like why does that keep happening? And possibly... One of the reasons uh, why why the Stark Direwolves dislike Tyrion is that in George Martin's original plans, he was going to have Tyrion uh, go to war against the Starks, uh, like actually participate in the war against the Starks. And Tyrion Lannister, he, he, here's the document. This is this is George Martin's 1993 draft, uh, his outline of what was going to happen in A Song of Ice and Fire, and it says right here, uh, Tyrion Lannister will besiege and burn Winterfell. Tyrion was going to go help fight the Starks alongside uh, Jaime. Um, and so the fact that Tyrion was going to burn Winterfell, I mean, in the books, it, it, it's Ramsay instead who does that, um, might be the reason why the why the direwolves hate Tyrion, because the direwolves have this sort of mystical, innate knowledge that, like, Tyrion will be an enemy to the Starks, because originally Tyrion was going to be, like, a major enemy to the Starks. Um, and then interestingly, later on, in this 1993 outline. Um, so it says, this is this is what George Martin wrote in 1993, Tyrion Lannister will continue to travel, to plot, and to play the Game of Thrones, finally removing his nephew Joffrey in disgust at the boy king's brutality. Jaime Lannister will follow Joffrey on the throne by the simple expedient of killing everyone ahead of him and blaming his brother Tyrion for the murders. Jaime was going to blame Tyrion and get him framed. And so Tyrion will get exiled and then Tyrion will change sides, making common cause with the surviving Starks to bring his brother down, bring down Jaime. And Tyrion will fall helplessly in love with Arya Stark while he's at it. His passion is unreciprocated, but no less intense for that, and it will lead to a deadly rivalry between Tyrion and Jon Snow. What? Such a different storyline, right? It was going in such a different direction. Um, and and yeah, so it goes to show how much his plans have changed. And I, and I think that the whole burning Winterfell thing might be the reason for um, the direwolves hating Tyrion. Because I, I don't think, I, I don't expect Tyrion to go against the Starks any more than he has already at this point. 
Uh, thanks for the super chat from Altid, who says, really love the content. Keep up the great work. Thanks for the super chat from XNGel0, who says, Varus means crow in Finnish, just like Bran means crow in Welsh. Varus equals connected slash controlled by Bloodraven, or he's a Targ, Blackfire. I don't think Varus is controlled by Bloodraven. I don't see a connection there. Um, I do think it's possible that Varus is a Blackfire. I, I think that it's possible that he is a relative of Sarah, who was the wife of Illyrio Mepatis, uh, and he's possibly a relative of young Griff, Aegon Targaryen, who might actually be a Blackfire. We talk about that in the Varus video and in the Blackfire Rebellions video, if you want to talk about that. I'm always a little bit skeptical of the whole, like, you know, this name means this in this language, because, like, especially when it's a name that with just, like, two syllables, like, any... There are lots of similar words that have similar sounds in different languages, and there's a lot of languages, like, news flash there's there's lots of languages you heard it here first and so like th there are many different like possible connections you could see that doesn't necessarily mean that george martin like is a big fan of finnish and named varus after crow in finnish like it's possible it's possible and, and like you know like the bran crow thing like that sounds kind of plausible to me but i i am skeptical of the idea that varus was named after the finnish word for crow Thanks for the super chat from Wandering Kangaroo, who says, If Tyrion is such a villain, why do we like him and support him so much? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Great videos. Keep up the good work. That's a great question, Wandering Kangaroo. If Tyrion is such a villain, why is he so cool? Why do we love him? Why do we feel for him? And that, I think, gets to the heart of why A Song of Ice and Fire is so great. Because the villains aren't just, like, evil dudes who just, like, like to, like to do horrible things for the fun of it. There are deep sympathetic, relatable, emotional reasons why, why Tyrion does the things that he does. He feels unloved. He's got a horrible relationship with his father. He has been betrayed. He, the people are prejudiced against him because of his appearance. He feels hurt. He, he wants, he wants approval. He wants friendship. He wants, he wants all these things. And, and all of those feelings are feelings that anyone can relate to on some level. Um, and those are the motivations behind his villainous behavior. And I think we all can relate on some level to doing something that we, we know is not the right thing to do, but we did it because of feelings and, and needs that we have. Um, and I think that's why Tyrion is such a great character and, and why people have so many different, you know, opinions and interpretations about Tyrion. Some people agree with the things that Tyrion does. Some people disagree with the things that Tyrion does. Some people think Tyrion is a hero. Some people think Tyrion is a villain. Um, and I, and I think that's true of many characters in A Song of Ice and Fire to varying extents. Um, like, like Stannis is a sort of a morally ambiguous character. Cersei is very villainous, but she also has some really interesting and, and I think sympathetic reasons for doing what she does. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's why Tyrion's a great character. I think that's why Cersei's a great character. I think that's why Song of Ice and Fire is a great story because it is fantastical. There's cool dragons, there's explosions, there's shadow monsters, there's tits and dragons, but there's also deep, powerful, compelling human drama at the core of it. And that is true of Tyrion um, as much uh, as anyone. Um, Tony says, what would you do with a jackass and a honeycomb in the brothel? Uh, well, if you put the honeycomb in the jackass... Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Toxic Banana, who says, In your opinion, how big is Tyrion's private bits? Now, I bet you thought that I wouldn't have an answer to that question. But if that's... You don't, you don't know Alt Shift X. Uh, because I've got right here a description of Tyrion Lannister's penis. You better believe I've got this ready to go. Uh, quote, uh, Even his manhood was ugly. Thick and veined with a bulbous purple head. That is Sansa's description of Tyrion's penis in book three. Um, so it's thick. Uh, that It's large, at least in girth. Tyrion has a girthy penis, confirmed. There's there, there's no mention of his length, his, his penis length in this line, uh, or indeed at any point in the books. Um, so is Tyrion's penis length proportional to his short height or is it or is it disproportionate and large? Unconfirmed. Maybe in the Winds of Winter we will finally find out how long uh, the imp's peen really is. Uh, but it is thick, confirmed. And I think it's hilarious that George Martin specifies that his penis is ugly. 
because like every part of Tyrion's body is described as being ugly. Like we don't mention it in the in the uh, video, but Tyrion's legs are described as being uh, stunted, short, and twisted, and it's it's painful and difficult for him to walk around sometimes. Um, Tyrion is shorter than Peter Dinklage, George Martin says. Like he's got crooked teeth in the books. Like whenever George Martin describes Tyrion, he always t- takes the opportunity to describe his body as ugly, and uh, that includes his wang. Uh, next question. Thanks for the super chat from Bailey, who says, "If Tyrion finds out he is a bastard of Aerys the Second, do you think he may lay claim on the Iron Throne?" for his own vengeance. George Martin did say he is a villain. So yeah, that that is another thing that we didn't talk about in the video is that, you know, if Tyrion is the son of Aerys Targaryen, that gives him some claim on the Iron Throne. Um, but the reason why that is maybe not a big thing is that Tyrion would be a bastard. Uh, because if Tyrion is the son of Aerys and, and Joanna, um, T- Ares and Joanna weren't married, and therefore Tyrion is a bastard. He'd he'd be called he wouldn't be called Tyrion Targaryen. He'd be called Tyrion Hill or something. Uh, that's unlike uh, you know Daenerys is the true-born daughter of Ares, uh, and Jon Snow at least in the TV show uh, he was the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark, and in the show. Uh, Rhaegar annulled his marriage to Elia and made a new marriage to Lyanna before John was born. So John, at least in the TV show, is the true-born son and heir uh, of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. Um, and that may also be true in the books as well. Um, so if Tyrion is a Targaryen, he's still a bastard Targaryen. And in the line of succession, that means Tyrion comes after Daenerys and after John, uh, Which means that his prospects for the throne, I think, are not very high but still yeah you're right like Tyrion might choose to want to go for the throne if he does find out that he's a Targaryen then he might want the throne for himself uh and that would mean having to kill Jon Snow and Daenerys probably um I I think I don't think I don't think that's a likely thing to happen but yeah sure it's possible it's possible um I, I, I don't know if Tyrion is even thinking about wanting to rule at this point, because like Tyrion in A Dance with Dragons, he thinks a lot about how he wants revenge. He thinks a lot about how he wants to kill Cersei and Jaime, but he doesn't really think very much about wanting to rule. He doesn't think about wanting to have power all that much. Like he doesn't, he, he's not, he's not thinking long term. He's thinking short term. Like that's exemplified by Tyrion's decision to uh, promise all this gold to Brown Ben Plum and the Second Sons. Uh, he offers, he, he promises to give them lots of gold, um, and that might be uh, difficult for him if he actually gets to Westeros alive, but he doesn't really worry about that, because he's like, well, whatever, like, if I die, I die, and I won't have to worry about it, and if we win, and I actually get Castle Rock or whatever, then I'll be able to pay it, but, like, he's, he's not thinking long term. Um, so, so maybe later on he'll decide that he wants to be ruler, but that's not really something he's thinking about right now. Diego says, what will John think of Tyrion once he comes back to Westeros? Incredible video, by the way. Thanks, Diego. Um, yeah, so John and Tyrion had this lovely friendship. Um, they, they connected over the fact that they're both sort of outcasts and they're both sort of, uh, feeling unloved and, and feel similar ways. And... John really likes Tyrion for sort of helping him to get w- face the hard truth about h- how the Night's Watch is kind of a shit place to be. Um, and he appreciates Tyrion for giving him advice about, you know, taking names and wearing it like armor. Um, and so, yeah, when John meets Tyrion again and Tyrion has become this deformed, ugly, hateful, murderous, vengeful kinslayer... Uh, yeah, maybe John will dislike Tyrion and will dislike what Tyrion has become. But but equally, you can speculate on, well, what will Tyrion think of what John has become? Uh, because Tyrion, because John in the books has uh, been stabbed. He is in the process of dying, it seems. Um, where is the cool shot that I want of Jon Snow looking all spooky? Here we are. So, so like in the TV show, when John gets resurrected, he doesn't really change. Like, his appearance doesn't change, his personality barely change, changes. He seems a bit more sad and tired 
in Game of Thrones season six, but he, his personality is fundamentally kind of the same. But there's speculation that Tyr- but that, that Jon Snow in the books, when he gets resurrected, will have a very different personality, that he'll be angrier, that he'll be more vengeful, that he'll be more connected to magic, more connected to prophecy. He'll discover his Targaryen blood and embrace his identity as a dragon. There's a whole thing about how Jon will probably, um, his soul will probably go inside his direwolf ghost for a while. Um, and there's this stuff about how, like, the more time you spend inside you, the, the mind of your animal, the more animalistic you become, and the humanity sort of goes away. And so if John becomes more wolfish inside Ghost before he goes back to his human body as Jon Snow, like, he may, be, he may be a more, like, violent, almost animalistic character, which we, which we could talk all day about how cool that could be. Um, and, and, you know, there's also a comparison to Beric Dondarrion, because Beric Dondarrion in the books becomes, like, barely human. He's a ghost of who he used to be. He's, he, and that's why he eventually decides to give up his life, because he's he's no longer Beric Dondarrion. So, you know, will Jon Snow still be Jon Snow, you know? Uh, so I think both Jon and Tyrion will... <laughs> they'll, they'll barely recognize each other. They both will have changed physically and psychologically and politically. And so I, I think it's anyone's guess what that relationship will be like. Um, it may be that they will both be more fiery and brutal as they will need to be in order to defeat the White Walkers and to reshape Westeros. So there's all sorts of possibilities there. Thanks for the super chat from JG, who says, I'd like to think Bran's story isn't about Bran's story per se, but the story the council can choose to spread as nation building propaganda. Okay, so JG is talking about like, you know, Tyrion's decision to make Bran king, which again, why was that Tyrion's decision? (laughs) Was he really that convincing? Um... But yeah, I, I, yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I think that makes sense as an interpretation. JG is saying that, well, you know, maybe Bran wasn't saying that, you know, the reality of Bran's decisions and, and Bran's experiences are really good. It's more about how we can spin this. And, you know, maybe they could spin it in a way that makes sense to the other lords and the common people. But I, I think Bran is an especially difficult person to spin as a good ruler because uh, he's a Stark and there's never been a Stark king of Westeros before. Um, it would make more sense to have Jon Snow. Like, like, it, like, it'll be very easy to spin Jon Snow as the rightful king of Westeros because he is the fucking rightful king of Westeros. Uh, Jon Snow would make sense. Bran does not make much sense because he's a Stark, he's a cripple, and people are prejudiced against crippled uh, cripples, people who are differently abled. Um, and he's not got a personality. Like, he's, he's very difficult to understand or to like, which is a quality that kings need in A Song of Ice and Fire. So, like, like yeah, I agree that that, 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 that is a, a potential interpretation, but, like, I don't think it would be easy to convince people that Bran would be a good king. Um, Emmett says, what character would you most like to see Tyrion run into and have a conversation with? Well, I hope he meets Tysha. I think that Tyrion reuniting with Tysha could be incredible. And like, this is sort of veering into fanfic in my head. Like there's very little indication, I think, in the books that Tyrion will meet Tysha. Like the whole Tysha being the sailor's wife thing. Like, like, I I think that is possible. But, like, I don't think, that, like, that there isn't a lot of, like, evidence that the sailor's wife is Tysha. Like, I mean, I mean, I, I talk about some of the evidence here. There is some hints that could be interpreted as evidence that Tysha is the sailor's wife. But it's by no means certain. But I would love for Tyrion to reunite with Tysha. And I would love to see them be disillusioned by each other. You know, like Tysha and and Tyrion imagine each other as being the, these these happy, innocent children, and they have changed so much. And so, I would love to see their reaction to each other. Um, I also would love to see Tyrion meet Blood Raven because 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 you know Tyrion's story has not intersected with the religion with, with the magical side of things mostly like he does talk to Macquaro and Macquaro has all of these prophecies about Tyrion which is really interesting um, and I think Tyrion will get increasingly exposed and connected to the magical side of things but Blood Raven is like the embodiment he is the most magical magical bloke in Westeros and having Tyrion meet uh, Blood Raven and face the reality of magic would be really interesting because Tyrion is one of the most skeptical of magic of anyone in A Song of Ice and Fire 
like he says some line about how, you know, he believes in men's wits and he believes in gold and he believes in steel uh, and he believes there once were dragons, but he doesn't believe in, in whites and white walkers and grumpkins and snarks and, and boogans and goblins and hobgoblins and maogwai. Um, he's a skeptic, he's a rationalist, and so it'll be, it'll be really fascinating to see him collide with the magical side of things. Um, I also would like to see Tyrion meet more common people. Because, like, one of the things about Tyrion is, that, like, yes, he is compassionate and sympathetic to some other people, like Bran, like Jon Snow, like Penny. But in my opinion, Bran is- uh, Tyrion is basically only sympathetic to people who remind him of himself. He's sympathetic to Jon because Jon is an outcast like him. He's sympathetic to Bran because Bran is physically disabled like Tyrion is. Yeah, Tyrion is also sympathetic to quote-unquote whores like uh, Barra's mother, who was killed by Janos Slint. And he's sympathetic to some of the sex workers he has sex with. Um, so, so he is sympathetic to people who remind him of Tysha. And he's sympathetic to people who remind him of himself. But he has very little to no sympathy for anyone else. <laughs> Especially the common people. Um, there are characters who care about the common people. Tyrion is not one of them. Uh, and so I would like to see him face that. Because I think that is one of Tyrion's crimes. Is the fact that throughout his time as Hand of the King, he, he expressed very little concern for the common people. Except for, you know, how that impacted Lannister power. Um, so I think that... It would be really cool if Tyrion had to face, hey, these are the common people who are suffering under the Game of Thrones. So maybe playing the Game of Thrones was not the right thing to do. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Eldinaldo, who says, not exactly in the topic, but do you think Euron will eventually get one of Danny's dragons? That horn seems like the real deal. Yeah, I agree. Um, so in the, t in the, in the books, um, Euron Greyjoy is a totally different character. He's a sorcerer. Uh, he's a sadist, he's unpredictable, he's scary, he's powerful, and he has this big, beautiful dragon horn from Valyria. He blows this horn at the King's Moot, and, and the runes glow with magical power, and it's a scream that, that breaks people's brains. It, it's this powerful, terrible, scary thing. And Euron sends Victarion to Slaver's Bay with the dragon horn, uh, and tells him to use the dragon horn to capture Daenerys' dragons and to bring the dragons back to him. And there's a lot of different directions that could go. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that could play out. Um, but, you know, Viserion in the TV show dies. One of Daenerys' dragons gets killed. Um, and in the show, he gets killed through this ridiculous uh, white hunt plot, um, which I think is ridiculous. Um, but I think that in the books he might die by some kind of different situation. And, and as I say in the Tyrion video, I, I, something that I'd like to see, and there's not really evidence of this, but something that I think would make sense is if Tyrion does meet Viserion, develops some kind of connection, hinting that Tyrion might have Targaryen blood, Tyrion might ride Viser Viserion for a bit, but before he fully develops that connection, maybe Vic maybe Viserion will be killed, or maybe the Euron will use the dragon horn to take over Viserion. Um, and that will, might be the equivalent of what happens in the TV show with the Night King taking control of Viserion. Uh, a lot of people speculate that it might be Euron who takes control of Viserion and becomes this sorceress, uh, terrifying figure who destroys the wall in the show. Because in the books, there is no Night King. There, there is no White Walker leader in the books. Um, and so some people speculate that, that Euron Greyjoy, as this terrifying sorceress powerful figure, might play that role. He might be the one who kills Viserion or takes Viserion. He might be the one who takes down the wall. He might attack Old Town. Um, so, and, and Euron is someone who cuts out people's tongues. And there are many times when characters talk about cutting out Tyrion's tongue. So I think it would make sense if Euron t uh, cuts out Tyrion's tongue and perhaps takes his dragon as well. That would be like the, the worst thing that could happen to Tyrion and Euron might be the one to do it. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Poison Biscuits, who says, Do you think Tyrion is the third head of the dragon? He, Jon, and Danny all had mothers who died in childbirth and dragons need sacrifice to be born. That's a really good point. 
Um, sacrifice is connected to magic and sacrifice is connected to the birth of dragons and the hatching of dragons specifically. Uh, like when Daenerys burns Miriam as Dur and the body of Drogo and that magical sacrifice seems to be part of what causes her dragon eggs to hatch. And uh, Melisandre wants to burn Edric Storm to wake dragons from stone at Dragonstone. And uh, Egg at Summerhall seems to have wanted to make some kind of sacrifice in order to hatch dragons at Summerhall. So, yeah, like that might suggest that since Jon Snow, Daenerys uh, and Tyrion, all of their mothers died in childbirth. And maybe that death is the sacrifice that gives some kind of magical power to each of these characters. Um, and so is Tyrion the third head of the dragon? Yeah, I think probably he is just because like who else could be the third head of the dragon? Like you could say Aegon, like like Aegon, I, I think Aegon is probably a Blackfire, not a Targaryen. Um, but even if he's a Blackfire, he has Valyrian blood. He has Targaryen blood because the Blackfires are descended from the Targaryens. So Aegon could be a dragon rider. Um, he could be the third head of the dragon, but I think that Aegon will be an enemy to Daenerys. So if Aegon gets a dragon, uh, he'll be fighting against Daenerys and her dragons, which which could make sense because like there are hints about a second dance of the dragons where Daenerys fights Aegon and there's this horrible fiery war that causes destruction all across Westeros. So maybe it would make sense for Aegon to be the third head of the dragon and to ride a dragon and to fight against Daenerys. That could make sense. You might also interpret it as Euron being the third head of the dragon. If it is that Euron takes Viserion and becomes a dragon rider. Um, and, you know, but there's also the fact that the whole idea of the three heads of the dragon, it's a very ambiguous concept. Like, it, it's not super clear what the three heads of the dragon means. The Three Heads of the Dragon, it's only mentioned in Daenerys's visions in the House of the Undying. And Daenerys is like, oh, Three Heads of the Dragon, like what what is that what does that mean? Hang on, I'll, I'll pull up the I'll pull up the quotes so y'all can have a look at them. This is everything we know about the Three Heads of the Dragon. Um so in book two, Daenerys in the House of the Undying, she sees Rhaegar she has a vision of her brother Rhaegar, and Rhaegar is with Elia, and Rhaegar is holding a baby, which is Aegon, um, who Young Griff supposedly is, but Young Griff probably isn't Aegon. And Rhaegar says, there must be one more, the dragon has three heads. So, uh, and then the Undying say it, uh, say it as well, three heads has the dragon. So that might suggest, like, like Rhaegar seems to have been into the prophecy of the prince that was promised. Like, it seems as though Rhaegar hooked up with Lyanna because he wanted to fulfill the prophecy. He wanted to create the hero who would save the world. And he seems to think that that idea of the hero who'll save the world is connected to this idea of the dragon has three heads. And that connects to the Targaryen heraldry because the, because the Targaryen sigil is a three-headed dragon. Um... Uh, but maybe there's some deeper prophetic meaning connected to Azor High and the prince that was promised. Um, and so Daenerys in the next chapter, she talks with Jorah and she's like, oh, what does that mean? The, the three heads of the dragon. Um, and, and Jorah says in book three, Jorah says the dragon has three heads. You've wondered what this means. Uh, the, the original Targaryen siblings rode three dragons. So you have no brothers, but you can take husbands, three dragons and three riders. So Jorah connects it to the idea of Daenerys's husbands and lovers. Um, so it kind of makes sense that if Daenerys has a relationship with Jon Snow or marries Jon Snow, that sort of supports the idea of Jon Snow being one of the three heads of the dragon. Um, also Euron wants to marry Daenerys. And Daenerys has a weird sex dream about Euron. So if Daenerys is romantically or sexually connected with Euron, who does want to marry her, that could position Euron as one of the three heads of the dragon, according to this idea that like her husbands are the three riders and the three dragon riders. Um, so maybe Euron is one of the three heads of the dragon. Uh, and so, you know, Daenerys thinks more about, you know, who's going to ride the dragons. The, Daenerys thinks there are two men in the world who I can trust. I will not be alone. We will be three against the world. Those are the three heads of the dragon, according to Daenerys. So Jon Snow totally makes sense. And, you know, if Tyrion is one of Daenerys's trusted allies, and if Tyrion is a dragon rider, then he, he could make sense. 
Um, interestingly, in book four, Amon thinks the dragon must have three heads, but I'm too old to be one of them. I should be with her, showing her the way. So Amon seems to think that, you know, the three heads of the dragon are Daenerys' allies who help her. Um, and if he was younger, he could be one. So maybe he also thinks that the three heads are like husbands or like partners, uh, or allies to Daenerys. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different sort of, it's very ambiguous is my point. So the question was, is Tyrion one of the three heads of the dragon? Yeah, he could be. He could be a dragon rider. He could be an ally to Daenerys. So it makes sense that he could be one of the heads of the dragon. But like, it's, it's, it's very ambiguous. It could go a lot of ways. It could be Euron or Young Griff. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Brenner, who says, when and under what context do you think we will see Casterly Rock in the books? It seems extremely vulnerable right now based on Sir Kevin's fate. Yeah, so in the books... Kevin uh, was regent, but he gets murdered by Varys and Varys's little birds. Um, and who runs Castle Rock now? Uh, good question. I, I, I believe George Martin has said that we will see Castle Rock in the books eventually. Um, and we did see it in the TV show. Castle Rock was attacked and taken over um, by Daenerys's armies, but then it gets taken back by the Lannister armies. And it doesn't really play a very significant role. Um... I, yeah, I, I don't know what role Castle Rock will play. I mean, there's a possibility that Tyrion will become Lord of Castle Rock because he is the rightful Lord to he is the rightful heir to Castle Rock. It's also possible that Tyrek Lannister um, will become Lord of Castle Rock because he's also one of the few surviving Lannisters, and Varys possibly has him. Uh, it's also possible that Cersei will go back to Castle Rock after her walk of shame and after losing power, and she might set herself up as a queen in the West. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what what role Castle Rock will play, um, but I, I think that you know we should see some of the Lannisters there. J Jamie has a dream about being in uh, Castle Rock, um, and so maybe that maybe he will face that. You know, I mean Castle Rock is where Jamie and and Cersei and Tyrion grew up. Like it's a big part of their identity as Lannisters, and especially if Tyrion is like questioning his identity as a Lannister, if he if he's thinking like, am I a Targaryen? Am I a Lannister? Maybe it would make sense for him to um, go back to Castle Rock in order to to reflect on his identity as a Lannister. That could make sense. Um, no cat boys allowed says, what do you think Tyrion's opinion is on CBT? Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy? Uh, uh, cats blowing trumpets? I don't know what you mean by CBT, bro. Um, I, I think he's I think he's all for it. Thanks for the super chat from Tan May, who says, How long will Stannis last with Ramsay's flaying? <laughs> All right, not exactly on topic, but whatever. Um, so in the books, uh, Stannis uh, tries to take Winterfell from Ramsay, uh, and he's still, he's still camped outside Winterfell. But in Jon Snow's last chapter, he receives a letter uh, purportedly from Ramsay claiming... Uh, that uh, Stannis has been defeated and claiming that Stannis is in a cage. Oh no, Mansa Raider's in a cage. No, he claims that Stannis is dead. R Ramsay claims that Stannis is dead. And a lot of readers don't believe him because it doesn't really make sense for Stannis to have died off screen without us, you know, seeing the conclusion to his story. Um, there's a lot of really cool theories about how Stannis will use a false uh, beacon to lure the Freys and, uh, onto ice and then to kill them and then to take Winterfell through trickery and clever tactics. Um, my point being that I, I, I don't think Stannis is dead. I don't think Ramsay has Stannis. Um, Ramsay might have Mance Raider though. Um, and he might have uh, Mance Raider's women, the, the, the wildling spear wives. Uh, so it might be that they're in for a spot of flaying. So that is unfortunate. Uh, thank you for the super chat from Geld. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Sanrixian, who says, do you think John will come back physically changed, i.e. different hair color? So yeah, we did we did discuss that a little bit, how Jon Snow might, you know, spend some time in his dire wolf. He might, you know, embrace the sort of fiery destiny of Azor Ahai. Uh, but Sanrixian mentions the hair color. And yeah, like maybe when John is resurrected, his hair color will change uh, from dark to uh, Targaryen blonde. Um, I mean, it's like our Theon, like Theon in the books, he has dark hair, but then, uh, after undergoing the torture in Ramsay's dungeons, his hair becomes white, like an old man's. Cause apparently that is something that can happen in the real world. When someone undergoes extreme stress, 
their hair color can change and become pale. Um, so death is a pretty traumatic experience, I would think. Uh, so it could make sense for Jon Snow's hair to become white, and that could also represent his embracing his Targaryen side. So yeah, I think that's a good idea, and I think that might happen. It would be really cool. I mean, it'd be a little bit anime if Jon Snow's whole like look changes, but you know, hey, this is a fantasy character. Like 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 the whole like the, in the books, the the whole aesthetic is a lot more colorful. It's a lot more fantastical. It's a lot more over the top. Everything from Castly Rock to the Mountain is bigger and brighter and bolder and more colourful, and that might include Jon Snow. Uh, Sudasan says, the Winds of Winter release date guess? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I rec- if, if I had to guess, I would guess it'll come in the next couple of years. Uh, but that's what I've thought for the last 10 years. So I don't know when the Winds of Winter comes out. And I don't think George Martin knows when the Winds of Winter will come out either. Uh, I think George Martin is as bad at guessing when Winds will come out as any of us. In fact, I think George Martin is worse at guessing when the Winds of Winter will come out. I, I actually like, I, I think that when creative people start a creative project, when they start a really ambitious creative project they would not embark on that project if they knew how much work it would be. I think one of the like prere- prerequisites for making ambitious art is that you have to have a completely delusional idea of how much effort it will take. You have to think that it'll be easier than it would than it will be because if you realized how hard it was going to be, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just too hard. Uh, I, I think that artists have to be a little bit delusional. And I think that's true of George Martin. I think George Martin has no fucking idea uh, how many th- thousands of hours it will take to write his books and how complicated they'll get. And I think he never would have started the project if, if he if he sort of knew, you know. Um, that's, that's one interpretation. Uh, thanks for the super chat from LOL who says, uh, Did Tywin's sharp lesson for Joffrey include him being raped by Tyrion? Uh, mm. So the term sharp lesson is used a few times by the Lannisters. Uh, Tywin uh, described it as a sharp lesson uh, when he, well, he didn't describe it. Someone described it as a sharp lesson. I think Jamie said it was a sharp lesson when Tywin had Tysha raped by uh, Tywin's guards. Um, and Tywin does at one point say that Joffrey requires a sharp lesson. And Tyrion thinks, oh, well, you know, Joffrey's got a sharp lesson coming to him. I know how bad those sharp lessons can be. Um, uh, so I think Lol is speculating that maybe Tywin did something horrible to Joffrey, but uh, the, that doesn't happen in the books. Um, I don't think Tywin got around to that sharp lesson. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Sudasan, who says, oh, sorry, yeah, Sudasan had more questions. Uh, he says White Walker equals climate change metaphor. Um, I think that George Martin has said that, like, yeah, like, th- there are similarities between the White Walkers and-, and climate change because, like, you know, it is this, uh, it is a changing climate that is the threat and it's something that's being not adequately dealt with because people are focusing too much on politics, just like climate change in the real world. Um, so like, you know, George Martin, I think has in interviews has said that, well, you know, it, like white walkers aren't all about climate change. That, that, that's one of many parallels that you can make. So there is a similarity, but it's not the only thing that the white walkers are about. Uh, Sudarsan says, is the 13th Night's Watch commander, the Night King? Um, so, so the Night's King is a figure in the ancient legends of, of the North, uh, and he's said to be someone who uh, married a creature who seems a lot like a White Walker or a White, and he became like this dark sorcerer ruling the Night's Watch from the Night Fort, and he made sacrifices to the White Walkers, and supposedly he was the 13th, ninth, ninth, uh, 13th uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Um, and a lot of people question that. A lot of people think that, well, uh, well what if... Um, that connects to the story of the last hero, because the last hero is, uh, according to one legend, one of the heroes who ended the first long night by fighting the White Walkers, and the last hero had uh, 12 companions, I think, off the top of my head. I think he had 12 companions. And so if you add together the last hero plus his 12 companions, you get 13. Uh, and, 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 you know, the last hero and his companions were the people who founded the Night's Watch, it seems. 
So maybe the 13th uh, Lord Commander is actually just like the 13th of the last hero and his 12 companions, which could mean that the the, the last hero is the Night's King. Because I do like that idea that maybe the Night's Watch was founded not just as uh, as as a force against the White Walkers, but maybe made some kind of alliance or compromise with the White Walkers. Maybe they were sacrificing the White Walkers through the Black Gate in the Night Fort. If you're interested in this stuff, go and watch the Ancient Stark Secrets Old Chief Dex video. Um, Sudarsan says, isn't Book 7's title itself a spoiler? Uh, well, Book 7's title, Book 7 has not come out yet, we, we, Book 6 has not yet come out yet, and I question whether the series can even be finished in two more books, so I don't, I don't know if this will be the title of the seventh and final book, but George Martin has said that the title of the seventh and final book will be A Dream of Spring. Um, and yeah, you could interpret that as meaning that spring has not come by the end of the seventh book, so maybe, you know, it's still winter by the end of the seventh book. But I don't know, like, like, like George Martin has said that the ending will be bittersweet. And so I, I think it's almost certain that the White Walkers will be defeated in book seven. Uh, but, but, but winter won't quite be totally over and there'll still be darkness. There'll still be problems. There'll still be tragedy, but there will be hope. There will be a dream of spring. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that title is ambiguous. It's not super, I, I wouldn't, I didn't see it as a spoiler. Thanks for the super chat from Richard. Thanks for the super chat from 70 subscribers with only one video challenge. What if real Arya Stark returns to the North after the Dance of the Dragons and Northern Lords don't believe her claim to be Stark? Uh, well, I think that one way that Arya could prove that she's a Stark is with Nymeria, because, you know, the whole, like, stark Diwolf connection is important. Um, and I think that Rickon Stark, people might question whether Rickon Stark uh, is really a Stark, but Rickon will have Shaggy Dog, and having the direwolf Shaggy Dog will, will prove that Rickon is is a Stark. Wyman Manderley sort of says as much in his plot that he wants to get Rickon as Lord of Wis or Lord of Winterfell. So uh, I think that might be a way that Arya can do it. But I don't expect Arya to be a Stark very much, honestly. I think I think Arya might have a um, tragic ending. I think that she might walk into her direwolf Nymeria, like she might die and walk into a direwolf. Uh, that's very speculative, but I think that might be an interesting ending. I, I, I don't think Arya will end the story as a Stark in Winterfell. I mean, just like in the TV show, she sails off into the West, which is almost equivalent to dying, because no one fucking comes back from sailing west of Westeros. Uh, it's like in Lord of the Rings, when, when Frodo sails west um, to the equivalent of heaven. Um, so I expect Arya to not end as, as, as a Stark in that sense. Thanks for the super chat from I Require Coffee, who says, Bran has been absent from the most political family squabbles, uh, so could he be a palpable ruler? Love your shift, when does alt shift only fans launch? Oh boy, that would be a sight to see, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, Bran has not been doing a lot of politics, has not been very involved in the relationships. Um, so what does he know about ruling? Good question. And I think that's part of why Bran will be a very different kind of king. Um, well, I mean, I mean, like, you know, we, we do see Bran being a politician in, uh, like, the start of book two, um, when Bran presides over the harvest feast at Winterfell. And he, you know, he welcomes the reeds and he deals with the phrase and he, and he, and he sort of watches over the, you know, Barbary Dustin and Wyman Manderley and some of the Northern politics that goes on. So like, you know, Bran has had some political experience. Uh, that is a thing. Um, so, you know, it's not like, it's not like Bran has no political experience. That, that could be developed further. Uh, Bill Miller, thanks for the donation. Uh, Nevden says... Edard is often criticized for not understanding his position as only second to the king, yet Tyrion also seems to be afraid to move against Littlefinger slash Varys. Isn't he making the same mistake as Ned? I mean, Tyrion makes moves against a lot of people. Like, like he does specifically not move against Littlefinger because he's worried that Littlefinger is too powerful with all of his financial connections. Even though he knows that Littlefinger framed him for the attempted murder of Bran. Um... So, uh, I don't know, there, there, I, I think there kind of are good reasons for Tyrion not moving against Littlefinger, and partly that's kind of a plot thing, like, I think George Martin just didn't want Littlefinger to be taken out by Tyrion at that point in the plot, so, I don't know, I, I don't think he's making the same mistake. T Tyrion does use power as Hand of the King, 
Um, he's not afraid to, um, in the way that you might think Ned is. Uh, thanks for the donation from Banana, who says, if at any point you became disappointed with the Game of Thrones television show, when was that? Um, I, it was gradual. I, I, I mean, like, see, like a lot of people, a lot of people talk as though season eight was, was the only bad season of Game of Thrones. Like, I mean, like, I, I think the first truly bad episode of Game of Thrones was season five, episode six, um, when the Sand Snakes were introduced and the Sand Snakes were such a car crash that they just got <laughs> like the whole Dawn plot just got deleted from the story in the following season. Um, and that's also the episode where Sansa gets raped by Ramsay, which a lot of people really hated. Um, I think season five, episode six was one of the first bad episodes. I, I think where, where Game of Thrones, the TV show really started breaking my heart was in season six with the Aya plotline. Because Arya's plotline with the Faithless Men was just so dumb and just made no sense. When she just, like, she got stabbed and fell in the canal, then she did parkour with the waif, and then Jack and Hagar said, you are now no one. Even though Arya was the opposite of no one, she was embracing her Stark identity. And then in season seven, when Arya wants to kill Sansa, like, I really like Arya, and her storyline just became garbage from season six onwards. Um, and I think that's, that's a big part of what turned me against the TV show. And, and, and really like sort of the nail in the coffin was when Arya killed the Night King and the White Walkers were defeated without any exploration of any of the mysteries about what the White Walkers were, what they were about, what, what was going on with the babies, what was going on with Craster, what was going on with the Night's King, what was going on with Starks and the, you know, like, like you know, they, they, they were never really interested in those mysteries in the TV show, but... The way that they, but like, you know, the, the Azora High prophecy was just not addressed, you know, the prince that was promised. Like, they did talk about the prince that was promised, like, multiple times in the show, but uh, I guess it was just Arya. Like, like the, the way they butchered Arya's character and butchered the, pro the prophecy stuff in one fell swoop, that turned me against the show in a lot of ways. Uh, H-C-R-O-M-P-I says... If Tyrion is a Targaryen and based on Richard III, who killed his nephews to be king, it wouldn't be crazy for him to try and kill Jon and Danny for the throne. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe the closer parallel is, you know, Tyrion being accused of killing Joffrey, who is his nephew. I think that is the parallel to Richard III killing his nephews. Um, especially if, as in the 1993 outline, Tyrion was actually originally going to actually kill Joffrey for real. Um... And I think that, you know, Tyrion, um, I mean, you know, part of the point is that, you know, he isn't really, he, like, at least in book three, Tyrion wasn't really as much of a villain as they thought. He didn't really kill Joffrey, uh, but people believed he was. And that has sort of turned Tyrion into the villain that they thought that he was. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe if Tyrion does become that villain, as he sort of does in book five, maybe, yeah, maybe he will try and kill Jon and Danny and take the throne. Thanks for the super chat from Nono, who says, Tyrion saying how Bran could ride a horse uh, and which to pick sounds like foreshadowing of Bran or Tyrion riding a dragon. Yeah, yeah. So in Bran's chapter, like, you know, so Tyrion gives Bran a special saddle so that he can ride a horse uh, after he was injured. And Tyrion gives specific instructions about how, how to train the horse to to be ridden well and like what you know, and he gives these specific instructions about like how to use the dragon right use the use the horse riding saddle uh, and yeah i agree no no that like that could very well be a hint that Tyrion will do something similar with daenerys's dragons he could design a saddle to ride the dragons he could learn how to like train the dragon and how to ride the dragon better even if Tyrion doesn't become a dragon rider himself, I think it would make a lot of sense for him to help Daenerys to ride and control her dragons better. Um, because in the books, like, it's not really so much of an issue in the show. But in the books, like, like Daenerys has a lot of trouble con controlling her dragons. Um, uh, Dr Drogon would not respond to neither whip nor word, and they keep eating children and stuff. So, like, that's unresolved in the books. And so I think Tyrion could be the help that Daenerys needs in order to... Uh, take better control of her dragons. Thanks for the super chat from Sydney, who says, what do you think Jon Snow's real name is? Um, some people think Jaehaerys, some people think Aemon, uh, some people think Trev. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, Sydney says, since Rhaegar was naming his kids after Aegon and his sisters, maybe he intended on naming the kid Visenya. Yeah, so like in that scene in the House of the Undying that we talked about before, where Rhaegar said there must be one more, he named one kid Aegon, he named one kid Rhaenys, uh, and those are two of the three siblings who conquered Westeros 300 years ago. So yeah, as Sydney says, maybe Aegon was planning on naming his third child uh, Visenya, and they would have been the three heads of the dragon who were going to save the world, and Aegon was going to be Azor Ahai, because Rhaegar did think that Aegon was going to be Azor Ahai at one point, but then it seems that Rhaegar changed his mind, uh, and his third child, Jon Snow, was not a daughter, it was a son. Um, so maybe it, maybe his name could be like the male form of Visenya, so maybe Visenyon or Viserion, ooh. Um, there, there's lots of possibilities there. Um, in the show, meanwhile, they decided that Jon Snow's name was Aegon Targaryen, which means that Rhaegar named two of his children Aegon Targaryen, which just is the most sp smooth-brained thing I've ever heard. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Baby Jesus, who says, What do you think is more likely, Tyrion being redeemed or falling deeper into darkness? I think Tyrion's story will get darker before it gets lighter. I mean, we talk about this in the Tyrion video. Like, I, I think there's a lot of evidence that Daenerys will wage a fiery, bloody conquest across Essos. Uh, I think they'll probably, like, attack and burn Yunkai, they'll, they'll attack and burn Volantis and Pentos, they could make other stops along the way, and I think Tyrion will be a part of that. I, I think that I, I think that Tyrion will, like, continue to have a complicated relationship with Penny, uh, but, like, there's pretty strong foreshadowing that Tyrion will reject Penny conclusively at some point. So, yeah, I, I think Tyrion's story will get darker before it gets lighter. I think that A Song of Ice and Fire in general will get darker in The Winds of Winter before it gets lighter in A Dream of Spring. Um, and I think that his darkness getting darker might make his eventual redemption more meaningful. If indeed he gets redeemed. Um, like, I don't think it'll be... Like, I don't think Tyrion will ever be a good guy ever again. Like, uh, his evil will never be erased. Um, and I think that the burning of King's Landing may be the most, like, evil thing that he does. And it might be after the burning of King's Landing that he starts to try and uh, turn more towards the light by trying to help defeat the White Walkers. That makes sense to me. Um, there will be both both goodness and evil in Tyrion's story. Bitter and sweet. Thanks for the donation from Comrade Khaleesi, uh, who says, why do you think Tyrion insisted on Jon dealing with Danny at the end of the show? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, so, so like, so, so Tyrion has very little impact on the story in Game of Thrones season eight. In fact, the whole second half of the TV show, Tyrion has very little impact because all of his plans fail. But one of the few things that he does do is that he convinces Jon Snow to kill Daenerys. Um, he has that conversation, one of the last conversations in the TV show. Well, they, ha they have a conversation where Tyrion convinces uh, Jon that the right thing to do is to kill Daenerys because she she's evil. She's gone. She's gone wrong like a rotten egg and she's got to be uh, scrambled. Uh, th th those are his exact words. Um, uh, and I think they just sort of did that as something for Tyrion to do. I mean, also, like, you know, it, like, it, it gives Tyrion something of an arc, because, like, Tyrion believed in Daenerys, and he found optimism and hope with Daenerys, but ultimately Daenerys was a false hope, and so Tyrion, uh, becomes disillusioned by Daenerys. Um, and so ultimately it's a very fucking, like, cynical, nihilistic moment. Um the ending of Tyrion's story in the show, because, like, his hope was false. He believed that she could make the world better, but she couldn't. She was Dragon Hitler. Um, it's an incredibly dark message and an incredibly depressing one. Um, and I, I think they were just trying to give Tyrion something to do. And then they just sort of made it, like, kind of hopeful in the end when he was, like, hanging out with the new small council. I don't know. I, I, I have very little to say about the final episode of Game of Thrones. I, I think that there, it, there's not a lot of deep meaning there, honestly. Um, and, and it seems to contradict his sort of hopeful turn in season six and seven, and it just sort of ends on a really cynical, dour note. Um, thanks for the donation from Michael, who says, Hey Shift, love your work. 
what do you think Rickon's role in the rest of A Song of Ice and Fire will be? He's hardly mentioned for obvious reasons, but he must have a bigger role than running in a straight line. Yeah, so Rickon's storyline is extremely cool in the books because he goes to a uh, island inhabited by cannibals and unicorns. Like, you can't make this shit up. Uh, and Rickon is like a wild child. Like, he's like the feral Stark. He's animalistic, and that's reflected by his direwolf shaggy dog. Um, and so there's a lot of directions that could go, but like Wyman Manderley, one of the Northern Lords, um, he sends Davos Seaworth to go and fetch Rickon from Skargos. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of speculation about like, you know, what Rickon might be up to, uh, when Davos finds him there on Skargos. Will it be riding Shaggy Dog? Will it be like a cool, feral, badass Stark with the cannibals of Skargos? So much cool stuff that could happen. Um, and then you might end up with a difficult conflict between Rickon and John and Sansa all being potential claimants as ruler of Winterfell. A lot of different people could be ruler of Winterfell. And they sort of tried to do that in Game of Thrones season seven when like John and Sansa were all sort of like competing to be the ruler of Winterfell. Something similar, but infinitely better might happen in the books and, and Rickon might be part of that. I think that it makes sense that Rickon might be killed by the Boltons or might be just tragically killed somehow because like I don't see Rickon being the ruler of Winterfell. Like he is not exactly politically minded. I mean, he's also fucking like four years old in the books, which is another one of the problems with the books because like George Martin originally intended for the story to take place over years and the characters would grow older as the story goes on. Um, but that doesn't happen because he, he, he was going to do a time skip, but then he chose not to do the time skip. And so Rickon's only like four years old. And so he probably can't have all that much of an impact on the story. Honestly, he's probably going to be more of a pawn of Wyman Manderley. Uh, but hopefully he'll do some badass stuff with unicorns and direwolves. That's what I hope. Thanks for the donation from Petey, who says, Do you think Tyrion has turned his back on his entire background, dynasty, and identity as a Lannister, or just Jaime and Cersei? No, I, d I don't think he's turned his back on his Lannister identity, because in his uh, most recent chapters in A Dance with Dragons, he declares himself Lord Tyrion Lannister of Castle Rock. He signs this deal with Brown Ben Plum, and he says that, you know, when we get back to Westeros, when I get the wealth of Castle Rock, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to make you a lord, I'm going to have political power as Lord Tyrion. Uh, and Tyrion also compares himself to Tywin Lannister. He thinks, he, he thinks that he could be twin to Tywin Lannister. Uh, and he thinks about Tywin's, like, strategies and stuff. So, like, you know, Tyrion, I think, is still a Lannister. He says a Lannister always pays his debts when he kills Nurse. So I think that he has not he has not abandoned his Lannister identity. I think he has embraced it more. And I think that he has specifically embraced his identity as the son of Tywin. And all of the brutality and all the revenge and all of the attitudes that that entails. And, and I think that, you know, something that we didn't talk about in the in the video, but something that is in the books, is that... Like some other characters, Tyrion sort of loses his Lannister identity. He, he's exiled, he's sent to Essos, and he uses fake names when he's in Essos. He calls himself Yolo. He calls himself No-Nose. He calls himself Hugo Hill. He takes on all these other fake identities to hide his true identity as a Lannister, uh, which is very similar to what Arya Stark does in the books. Arya goes by many names. Um, Aya is, is Salty and Squab and Nymeria and, and, and all these different names, um, as she loses her identity when she becomes one of the faceless men, um, she, she loses her Aya Stark identity. Uh, and it's only towards the end that she, you know, she, she's having these wolf dreams and it seems as though she will eventually finally return to her identity as Arya Stark. And that's the same thing that Tyrion does at the end of uh, Dance of Dragons. He re-embraces his identity as a Lannister, as the most terrible, violent kind of Lannister. So, yeah, I think Tyrion is as much of a Lannister as he's ever been. Uh, that's crazy talk says, what do you think about the show ruining Jamie Lannister's plotline? Um, I, I actually, I, I don't like what they did with Jamie, but I don't hate it as much as some people do. Um, because like, you know, Jamie, you know, there's a lot of talk about Jamie having like a redemption arc. Like, you know, he, he hooks up with Brienne and he, and he admires Brienne's, you know, values as a knight and he chooses to fight with the white, fight against the white walkers. Um, uh, but then ultimately he abandons Brienne, um, and he returns to Cersei. Um, and 
I, I think that that makes sense to me um, because, you know, it, it might be too sweet and easy and happy if Jamie just became a good dude. Um, I think that sometimes people try and fail to improve themselves. And I think that Jamie returning to Cersei, who represents all of his bad impulses and all of his bad habits, I think that that is a realistic thing that people do. And I think that it's kind of an appropriate, tragic ending. I think that Jamie will die with Cersei. I think that makes a lot of sense. There are hints in the books that he will die with Cersei. I think that he may strangle Cersei to death, uh, perhaps while they die together, as the Valonqar prophecy hints. There's many possibilities. Um... So yeah, look, I, I don't think the show handled Jamie's ending well, but I think that something similar may happen in the books. I think that Jamie may, you know, flirt with the idea of being a better person, but I think that he might ultimately fail and, and, and go to Cersei. And, you know, maybe it will be redemptive when he kills Cersei. You know, he might be trying to stop her from burning King's Landing with wildfire. It, go and watch the Old Shift X Jamie video or the Old Shift X Cersei video. We've, we've talked about this stuff, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't think the Jamie arc's good in the show, but I don't think it's as terrible as some people say. Um, thanks for the super chat from Beef, who says, You've talked about Tyrion and Danny going up north to fight the White Walkers, but rarely speculate on how Stannis comes into the mix. Yeah, I, we need to do, like, a proper Stannis video sometime, because Stannis is one of those many characters who was totally, like, given a raw deal by the show. Stannis is so much more interesting in, in the books. Um... I don't know what's going to happen with Stannis. I think Stannis will burn Shireen, like George Martin has, has said as much. Um, and I think Stannis will take over Winterfell. Uh, what a lot of people speculate is that, you know, Stannis will succeed in taking Winterfell, but then Winterfell will be overrun by the White Walkers. Um, and Stannis might become almost like a Night's King kind of a figure. Like, because the Night's King... The Night's King is someone who makes a dark... Well, no. Azora High is someone who makes a dark sacrifice in order to make the sword Lightbringer. Uh, according to the legend, Azor Ahai killed his beloved wife Nissa Nissa um, in order to forge the sword Lightbringer. Uh, I think that Stannis sacrificing Shireen to try and, you know, uh, take Winterfell is part of this pattern of Stannis making sacrifices to get power. And Stannis is actively trying to fulfill the prophecy of Azor Ahai to defeat the White Walkers with Melisandre. That's a whole thing. Um, but I don't think he's going to succeed. I don't think Stannis is the hero who'll save the world. Um... So, I, I don't know, maybe he'll be, like, tragically overrun by the White Walkers at Winterfell. Um, and he will have made sacrifices, but it will have failed and only made him, like, a darker figure. Maybe Stannis will become, like, a, a, a sort of a dark, nasty, White Walkery figure. Because um, so, so much of his arc is about that question of sacrifice. Will he burn Edric Storm? Will he burn his men? Will he burn Shireen? What is he willing to do to try and make uh, the prophecy come true? Um, so I think something very dark and, and nasty might happen. Um, but I think that he will take Winterfell for sure. We, we'll have to do like a proper deep dive and make a Stannis video sometime. Thanks for the super chat from uh, Melon Kopf, who says, Top three favorite chapters in A Song of Ice and Fire. Ooh, I, well, I really like the Wyman Manderley chapter where Wyman says that, you know, um, my son is home. And this mama's farce is almost done. The North remembers. And he reveals his, like, conspiracy against the Boltons. Like, that's incredibly cool. Like, the entire Winterfell plotline in A Dance with Dragons is awesome. And that Davos chapter where Wyman reveals his conspiracy and reveals the whole Rickon plotline uh, is super cool. So that's one of my faves. Um, what else? I mean, like, Tyrion killing Tywin is, like, a high point of the whole series. Um, so that's in the... Um, I, I like Jamie when Jamie talks to Jenna. Uh, that's another thing that we like could have talked about in the video, but didn't. Um, is Jenna Lannister tells Jamie that you know Jamie, you're a lot like your uncle Tiggett. You you like your uncle Garion. Uh, you like your uncle Kevin. Uh, but the person who's most like Tywin is Tyrion. Um, because Tyrion is you know brutal and scheming and ashamed and lustful like Tywin. Uh, that's basically what Jenna, well, or Jenna, Jenna implies that. And so, um, and so I think that's one of my favorite chapters as well. There's so many, there's a lot of goddamn chapters. I, I like storylines more than I like chapters, you know? Um, Solomon says, will we ever see your face? Uh, sure. All right. We'll do a face reveal. Uh, my face looks, uh, exactly like this. I am Peter Dinklage. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks for the super chat from Aprilla, who says, Alt Shift X, will you ever write a book? If you did, what genre or setting would you pick? Um, well, look, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not much of a writer, but you might be interested in the work of a writer called Martin Cordial. That's Martin with an E. Martin Cordial uh, has a YouTube channel where Martin writes some odd stories. They tend to be a little bit fantastical or science fictional, but there's a variety of stuff in the oeuvre of Martin Cordial. So uh, you all could check out that YouTube channel if you're interested. Martin Cordial has also been featured on the Random Article podcast, which you can also find on YouTube. Um, there's also some sort of fiction there that might be of interest. Uh, thanks for the super chat from not no cat boys allowed, who says that CBT stands for cock and ball torture. Thanks. Thanks for enlightening me. No cat boys allowed. I, I can't unread that. Thanks for the super chat from not who says, what is the difference between dragons and Sothorios Wivens? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so Wivens are creatures who live in Sothorios, which is like the jungles of uh, A Song of Ice and Fire that's sort of equivalent to Africa, sort of equivalent to Australia. Um, Australia in terms of having a lot of uh, deadly creatures like drop bears that, you know, want to murder you. Um, and wh one of the theories that I really like is that, like, we know that the Valyrians had like an outpost on Sothorios and the Basilisk Isles. Uh, where they did weird experiments mixing species and stuff like that. So a lot of people speculate that maybe the Valyrians, they didn't discover dragon eggs. They actually created dragons uh, by like mutating and, and like performing magical hybridization experiments on wyverns. Uh, which I think is super fucking cool. Like, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, like, fantasy elements in A Song of Ice and Fire that might actually be science fictional elements. Like, Press and Jacobs talks about this. Um, like, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire seems almost post-apocalyptic in a lot of ways. Like, a shy looks like some kind of nuclear wasteland, like fucking Chernobyl. Um, and maybe wyverns are actually the result of, like, uh, dragons are the result of genetic manipulation of uh, wyverns. Uh, George Martin was a sci-fi author before he wrote A Song of Ice and Fire. And he wrote a lot about like like genetics and mutation and, and, and species and hybrids and, and that sort of stuff. And I think that definitely shines through in A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that it makes sense that dragons are actually created from wyverns. Because wyverns, the, the difference between wyverns and dragons is that they're both big lizards, but wyverns, wyverns don't breathe fire. So, so maybe, you know, the Valyrians basically took Wyverns and gave them the magical power to breathe fire through some kind of fucking crazy magic sacrifice. Maybe they interbred with the Valyrians and that gives the Valyrians their, like, inherent connection to dragons. That's why only Valyrians can ride dragons. All sorts of possibilities there. Thanks for the super chat from GT Black, who says, Do you think Dawn will reappear and hold any significance? So Dawn is a legendary sword uh, that was wielded by the Danes, um, and uh, and there's this guy called Edric, uh, fucking what's his name? Um, I am of the night, D Dark Star. He wants to. He wants the sword Dawn. It seems, and so we speculate the in the in the Dawn video that maybe uh, Dark Star will steal Dawn and will wield it. And we also speculate that Dawn might be the ancient sword Lightbringer that was used by Azor Ahai to defeat the White Walkers. So I think it is possible that Dawn might be taken by uh, Gerald Dane, Darkstar, but then Darkstar might be killed and then maybe Jon Snow will get Dawn and then Dawn will be relit and it'll take on fire and it will become Lightbringer again and be used to defeat the White Walkers. I think that's uh, fairly likely, actually. Uh, thanks for the donation from Dopey Dragon, who says, Is there any real chance Tyrion reclaims Castly Rock? If not him, who's the next likely to claim it? If That is, if the whole previous form of government in Westeros isn't abolished for something more democratic. I, I don't think we're going to get, like, like the, the abolition of feudalism in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, you know, that they laugh that idea away. They laugh away the idea of democracy in uh, Season 8. And I think... You know, we're not going to get, a, you know, representative parliamentary democracy in Westeros anytime soon. I think feudalism will remain, maybe with some reforms. Um, and will Tyrion be Lord of Castly Rock? I, I, I think that he probably won't. If I had to guess, I'd say that Tyrion will join the Night's Watch or he will become a maester 
one of those sworn uh like, like like it is such a common thing in a song of ice and fire like george martin loves these sworn brotherhoods that like you know criminals and exiles and misfits can go to and i think that is so fitting for Tyrion because he is such a misfit and he is such an exile and he is such a criminal so i i think that it makes the most sense in my head for Tyrion to go uh be the librarian at castle black or he could be both a maester and a uh, Night's Watchman, like Aemon Targaryen, sworn and chained. Um, so I, I tend not to think that Tyrion will rule Casterly Rock, um, and I think that next in line will probably be Tyrek Lannister, uh, who uh, Varys probably has. Thanks for the super chat from Anonym, uh, who says, which A Song of Ice and Fire character would have a rap career? I mean, probably Tyrion. Tyrion is so eloquent and witty and rude and fun, and uh, he's such a loud mouth. So I think Tyrion would absolutely uh, have a great rap career. Um, I don't know who else is more eloquent. Uh, I mean, Varys is kind of eloquent. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Marlon, who says, I love you. Oh, thanks, Marlon. Love you too. Uh, Sue You Love says, in an episode of A Game of Thrones Abridged, Alt Shrift X mentioned that you are his twin brother, but you've also mentioned that you've never met. Please explain. Um, well, does it count as meeting someone if you're in the womb together? It's hard to get to know someone in the womb. Um, look, it's, it's complicated, uh, the whole Alt Shrift X, Alt Shrift X relationship. It's, uh, uh, it's, some, it's a topic for another time. Thanks for the super chat from the Volcanic Masochist, who says, Thoughts on the parallels of the dragon's names. Uh, yeah, well, you got uh, Rhaegal, who's named after Rhaegar. Uh, and so it makes a lot of sense for Jon Snow, the son of Rhaegar, to ride Rhaegal. Uh, you got Daenerys riding the dragon Drogon, who's named after Drogo, just like Daenerys rode Drogo. Uh, and then you got Tyrion uh, potentially riding Viserion. And Viserion's interesting because Viserion, he's, he's, in, he's named after Viserys, and Viserys is sort of the crazy, weak Targaryen who died early. Um, he's sort of the outsider. He's sort of the misfit. He's sort of the not quite right in the head one. Um, and, you know, maybe that sort of connects to Tyrion. You could also argue that that connects to Euron, actually, if you want to go with the idea that Euron will ride a dragon and will, and will steal Viserion and will uh, be one of the three heads of the dragon in some sense. So, uh, you know, there's a few possibilities there. Um, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about Tyrion because I do have like a bunch more stuff to say. And this live stream's always gone on for a while. Uh, R Richard says, thank you for all your hard work. Do you think that Tyrion will maintain his intelligence in the books, unlike the show? Yes, I think he will. And I think he'll use his intelligence to hurt people. Uh, and that's what's going to be terrifying about him. I mean, we talked about Jenna Lannister saying that, like, 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 like Jenna Lannister tells Jaime that, that Tyrion is Tywin's son. Um, and, and, the, and before that, she says, um, we, we, she says that, like, Tywin's son, we still have Tywin's son, and Jenna says, and that is what I fear. Jenna fears that Tyrion is Tywin's son, because Tyrion is just as, like, competent and cunning and ruthless as Tywin, except he's also fucking villainous. So I think that Tyrion will be a very dark and scary force in the books. Like, in the show, like, Tyrion became like, incompetent, but with good intentions. I think Tyrion in the books is the opposite. He is competent, but with bad intentions. And I think that's so much more interesting as a character. Thanks for the super chat from Adam, who says, Do you think readers and characters put too much faith in visions? Is George Martin deliberately being misleading? Perhaps Tyrion is right to be skeptical. So, uh, so, so yes and no. Um, th there are many, many examples and many, many lines in the books about prophecies and dreams being, uh, misleading and leading to people's downfall. Um, uh, prophecy is a, is a sword with no hilt. Uh, sorcery is a sword with no hilt. Melisandre says that she's mistaken warnings for prophecies and prophecies for warnings, and she misreads her prophecies. Uh, Amon says, my brothers dreamed of dragons, and the dreams killed them, every one. Marwyn says that prophecy will bite your prick off every time. Cersei drives herself to her own self-destruction by obsessing over the prophecy of the Valenquire and the more beautiful queen, and she probably misinterprets it. Misinterprets it. Um, Daenerys thinks that prophecies are treacherous. She thinks that prophecies are made of words and words are wind. 
Um, so, there, so there absolutely is danger in people misinterpreting prophecies. Um, that absolutely happens all the time. Um, but at the same time, there is undeniably truth and power in prophecies and dreams. Um, like in the Hedge Knight, we see prophecies at work. Um, like Deir on the Drunken, dreams of a dead dragon uh, with Dunk. And that ends up being a prophecy foretelling the death of Baylor Targaryen. He represents the dragon. Um, and uh, in the Mystery Night, uh, Daemon Blackfire II has these dreams that Dunk will be in the Kingsguard. And Dunk does indeed eventually join the Kingsguard. And he dreams of a dragon hatching at White Walls. And that represents uh, Aegon V, Egg, hatching into his Targaryen identity at White Walls. Um... And also, like, like Jojen foresees the Ironborn attacking Winterfell, um, and Daenys the Dreamer foresaw the Doom of Illyria, um, and Patchface uh, foresees the Red Wedding, and so does the Ghost of High Heart. Uh, the, the, the House of the Undying Visions, a lot of them come true. Uh, there are many, many dreams that are true dreams can tell the future in a song of ice and fire but dreams can also be manipulations like blood raven gives jojen some of his dreams and you got to wonder is blood raven manipulating jojen because blood raven is an incredibly manipulative uh character and there are these things called glass candles that allow characters to enter people's dreams quaith enters daenerys's dreams and gives her these prophecies and you've got to wonder is quaith manipulating daenerys quaith isn't being entirely honest she's wearing a mask we don't know who we, who she is or what she wants so absolutely, like prophecies can't be entirely trusted, but also prophecies absolutely can uh, be legit. So dreams, prophecies, visions, like George Martin is constantly playing with, with are they trustworthy? Are they reliable? Sometimes they lead to people's downfalls and usually they come true in ways that we don't expect. And I think that will be true of Azora High and the Valenquire and all of that stuff. Uh, Solomon says, if you could ask George Martin a question, what would it be? Um, uh, People always ask uh, George when The Winds of Winter will come out, but people don't ask how George Martin is. I would ask George Martin how he is and if he would like a cup of tea. Honestly, George Martin has already been asked all the interesting questions, and he usually refuses to answer them. George Martin wouldn't answer anything spoilery, so I don't know. I'd just, I'd just buy him a beer. Uh, Braun says, I don't know if my first super chat went away or something, but can you say hi to my girlfriend, Sabrina? It was our anniversary and we both love you and Game of Thrones and that guy, Swift. Sabrina, Braun, happy birthday, happy anniversary. Uh, I hope you have a great time and thanks so much for watching and I hope you have a lovely week. Cheers, Sabrina and Braun. Thanks for listening. Okay, let, let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, Tyrion, because I do have, like, a whole bunch of stuff to say about Tyrion. Um, so we talked about how Peter Dinklage played Richard. We talked about the 1993 outline. Um, one of the lines that I find really interesting is, is that in the books, Tyrion gets to sit the Iron Throne. They didn't do that in the TV show, but, like, the Hand of the King has the right to sit on the Iron Throne. Um, Tyrion sits on the Iron Throne as Hand of the King, um, and he likes it. The line is that Tyrion looked down on them all and found that he liked it. And I find it really interesting that that line parallels Cersei's first line in her first POV chapter. When Cersei dreamt she sat the Iron Throne high above them all, and she like thinks about how much she loves it, having uh, status and power. Um, and Tyrion thinks like exactly the same thing. So I think that's a really interesting deliberate parallel between Tyrion and Cersei, which shows that in some ways they're not so different. They both want power, they both want status, they both want appreciation and love, um, and they're both competing for Tywin's attention. So um, I think that's uh, a really interesting parallel. Um, another thing is that like Tyrion installs a high septon, like he installs a pope in the books, um, and he like tells the septon to preach lies about Stannis, and it's just another example of Tyrion being, um, you know, another plot and a scheme, and and then Cersei kills his high septon. It's not really a big deal. Uh, another thing, one thing that's kind of interesting is um, this guy Solorion. So 
Tyrion uh, orders these smiths and these craftsmen to craft this big chain. He forges this enormous big long chain to block off back Blackwater Bay when he blows up Stannis' ships with wildfire to trap the ships inside. And he and, he, and there's this scene where he tells the craftsmen to, to make this chain. And one of these craftsmen is like, hey, well, like, I don't want to be forging a chain because, like, I am, like, a master armorer. I create, like, elaborate, beautiful, intricate armor and stuff. And Tyrion is really rude and aggressive to this guy, and he says that, no, nope, you'll be making chains, or I'll, or you'll be wearing chains. Like, he's really sort of aggressive. And I think that's part of Tyrion, like, really enjoying lording it over people in a way that might not actually be politically smart. Because later in the book, Solorion and a bunch of other, like, like craftsmen and tradespeople, uh, they have a conspiracy against the Lannisters to support Stannis instead. They're called the Antler Men. Um, and, you know, you can speculate, you can, you can interpret it that, you know, Tyrion's hostility to Solorion uh, is one of the reasons why Solorion and the other Antler men rebelled against the Lannisters. So that's another example of Tyrion's, you know, aggression and, like, political heavy-handedness uh, creating enemies for the Lannisters and, like, working against his own interests. Um, so I think that's an example of that. Um, another thing that's interesting is that, you know, Tyrion's relationship with sex workers. Um, so he has a lot of sex with, uh, sex workers and he has a lot of sympathy for sex workers. When Tyrion gets rid of Janos Slint, he does it partly because, um, Janos Slint killed a sex worker and her baby. The baby was called Barra. And the mother in the TV show was named Megan. Um, and Tyrion has this line where he thinks that um, Tyrion, hearing only some whore and thinking of Shay and Tysha long ago and all the other women who had taken his coin and his seed over the years. So there's this line where Tyrion is thinking about his how he sympathizes with sex workers because of all the relationships that he's had with them and with Tysha and with Shay. Um, so he has this special sympathy for them. But then, that, uh, the reason why I bring this up is that then in book five, Tyrion has a special hatred for sex workers. He torments and he rapes a sex slave in Pentos. Um, well, well, sorry. He torments and he threatens to rape a, a sex slave in Pentos. And then in Cell Horus, he actually rapes a sex slave. Um, and, and I just think it's really striking that Tyrion in book two had expressed a special sympathy and a special compassion for sex workers. But then in book five, he expresses a special hatred of, of women and of whores. Um, and he and he rapes and, and torments these women, um, which is just, it's an illustration of just how dark uh, Tyrion has become and how he's changed and how he's become like the opposite of everything that was good inside him into something hateful instead. Um, I think it's interesting how Tywin really, like, lives rent-free in Tyrion's head. Um, there's, 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 like, a few lines, like this line where, where Tyrion thinks that perhaps my lord father was right to despise me all these years, if this is the best I can achieve. Like, he's really harsh on himself, just like Tywin is harsh on Tyrion. And that continues even after Tyrion kills Tywin, because even after Tyrion kills Tywin, uh, in Book 5, there's this mysterious figure called the Shrouded Lord, and... Tyrion equates the Shrouded Lord with his father Tywin. He he has a nightmare where Tywin is the Shrouded Lord. And then at the end of book five, he like, you know, he he thinks, ooh, you know, Tywin would have poisoned the wells. That's what I should do too. So, you know, it it just illustrates how Tywin is such a huge influence on Tyrion and continues to be a huge influence on Tyrion even after Tywin's death. Um, another thing that's kind of funny is that Tyrion's scar changes. Um at the end of book two, uh, Tyrion's scar is described as a starting under his left eye and ending on the right side of his jaw. But in the start of book three, uh, the great gash runs from above one eye down to his jaw. So it was above the eye, but then, but then it was below the eye in the previous book, which just goes to show that George Martin makes mistakes, especially with like characters' appearances. Um, it, it's funny, like, with, with Tyrion, like, like, Tyrion loses half his nose, which, like, I feel like would uh, have a big impact on, like, how you breathe and how you sound and how you, like, 
it would be cold and uncomfortable and like, but you know, George doesn't really get into much what it really looks like or what it really feels like for Tyrion to be missing half his nose. Um, and then, you know, it's understandable that the TV show chose not to make Tyrion lose half his nose because it would have been difficult CGI to have to CGI out Peter Dinklage's nose all the time. Um, another thing that I like, like with the Tywin Tyrion relationship, like, like uh, something that I could have talked about more in the video is like, you know, we talk about how Tyrion and Tywin are ultimately very similar. You know, they're both spiteful and cunning and lustful and full of shame. Um, but like sort of the difference between Tywin and Tyrion is that Tywin tries to project this image of being this proud, untouchable, rational, cold, golden lion. Like like the, the books especially like have Tywin wearing this resplendent, shiny, golden armor and he looks fancy and he looks handsome. Um, and so he tries to hide his sort of internal shame and, and lust and, and cunning. Uh, there's this great line where, like, you know, Tywin is describing how he plotted the Red Wedding. And Tyrion's like, ooh, that's a very cunning plot. And Tywin says, oh, plot, I mislike that word. Because Tywin doesn't want to think of himself as being cunning and deceptive. He wants to think of himself as being proud and honest and, you know, outward force and outward appearance. But, like, you know, he, he's trying to hide that that scheming, devious part of himself. Um, and so, you know, a line that I that we could have used in the video would have been something along the lines of, you know, uh, Tyrion, Tyrion's uh, twisted body and Tyrion's cynical, sarcastic comments undermine the pride of House Lannister and it peels back the fake superficial gold uh, of Tywin and reveals the lies and corruption beneath. Like, for example, when Tyrion calls Joffrey a monster, like none of the other Lannisters call Joffrey a monster. Like Cersei pretends that Joffrey is just, you know, he's just spirited. He's just passionate. That's why he tortures kittens to death. You know, like Tyrion is one. Tyrion so often is the only person who tells the truth, speaking truth to power. Um, and I think in that way, he peels back the superficial veneer of, you know, perfection that Tywin likes to, likes to show, um, and reveals the lies and corruption beneath. It would have been cool to include a, a line like that, uh, in the video, I think. Um, thanks for the donation from Swifty Tangent, who says, hey, Shift, do you think Tyrion will make it to Danny? Also, do you think she will accept Jorah back into her service ever again? Um... I do think that Tyrion will make it to Danny. I think that he will become her advisor, something like in the TV show. Will Jorah be accepted back into her service? Um, I don't know. I think that he will have a role to play with Daenerys. Uh, there is something I would like to say about Jorah, which is that um, I think that he might kill Victarion. So it, it's cool that in the books, when Jorah becomes a slave, he, he gets horrifically beaten. Uh, and he gets tattooed with a demon on his face because slaves who are disobedient uh, get that tattoo, that get that brand. And so Jorah is notably uglier in the books. I mean, Jorah was always uh, uglier in the books than in the TV show. He's very hairy, he's balding, he's old. Um, he's not He's not as handsome as Ian Glenn. Um, he's a lot creepier in the books. Um, and so I think all of that will, will color his, you know, his role in the Winds of Winter. Um, but something that I think is really cool. I, I heard this on the History of Westeros podcast YouTube channel, which is one of the best, uh, Song of Ice and Fire YouTube channels. You all should check out History of Westeros. Um, but there's this interesting line that, uh, the History of Westeros show pointed out where, um, there's a line in one of the Tyrion preview chapters where Tyrion is thinking about the Battle of Fire, the battle for Marine that's about to happen. And he thinks, a stupider man might have thought it grand and glorious right up to the moment when some ass ugly Yunkish slave soldier with rings in his nipples planted an axe between his eyes. So Tyrion thinks that someone who thinks war is glorious and so will be killed by an ass ugly Yunkish slave soldier with rings on his nipples. And as it happens, Jorah uh, wears armor that has uh, rings through nipples on the breastplate, which like big fucking coincidence, right? And also 
Jorah is a slave soldier, or he was a slave soldier until he was freed. He was a slave soldier of the Yunkishmen, so he is like a Yunkish slave soldier. And he is ass ugly because he's been beaten and he's got this horrible tattoo. And Victarion, he is a stupid man. George Martin said that he's dumb as a stump. And Victarion, as he's approaching the battle for Marine, uh, he thinks about the glory that he's going to get in this war. Death or glory, I will drink my fill of both today, Victarion thinks in a preview chapter. So Victarion and Jorah perfectly fit this this line that Tyrion has about, about a Yunkish slave soldier with rings in his nipples killing someone who thinks who someone who is stupid who thinks war is glorious so my point is that i think that aziz on history of westeros is correct and i think that it makes a lot of sense for jorah to kill victarion so i think that may be um i think that may be part of jorah's role in the books um i'm sorry if i miss some of the super chats but i'm doing my best to answer them all um uh, Irradiated Crow says, what do you think will happen to Littlefinger? Will Varys kill him when he arrives with Aegon? Daenerys burn him alive? Maybe he runs off to Braavos? Uh, I think that Sansa will bring about Littlefinger's downfall. Uh, I think that Sansa will use all of the lessons that she learned from Littlefinger to bring down Littlefinger. And I think Littlefinger will be killed with the Valyrian steel knife that he used to start the War of the Five Kings by blaming Bran's attempted assassination on Tyrion. Um, and maybe Arya will be the one to wield that knife. Like, I really disliked the Sansa and Arya versus Littlefinger plotline in Season 7, uh, but I think that in the books something very similar might happen, just in a very different way. Uh, so I think that it does make a lot of sense for Sansa and Arya to bring down Littlefinger, and maybe Arya will be the executioner using the Valyrian steel knife. Um, so you Love says, has anyone in your real life ever mentioned your amazing voice or is this just an internet thing? Well, I only talk like this on the internet. In real life, I sound like this. Um, thanks for the super chat from Daniel Hendrick, who says, you're the best. Glad I could tune in. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Ranger Donald One, who says, "What will the relationship between Tyrion and Sansa be like once or if they meet again, with them being completely different people since they last met, and how will Littlefinger play in?" Yeah, so it's interesting that you know both Tyrion and Sansa they they continue to think of each other as being each other's spouse. Um, like like Sansa thinks that Tyrion is still her husband. Um, and Tyrion still sort of feels protective of Sansa after Sansa leaves King's Landing and, um, he sort of feels like he shouldn't implicate her in the death of Joffrey. Um, so yeah, it will be very interesting when they meet again and it's possible that their marriage might be relevant, uh, cause their marriage hasn't been like formally annulled as, as of yet. Um, so maybe their partnership will be politically relevant. Like maybe Tyrion will use their marriage to form an alliance between the Starks and the Lannisters, perhaps. Um, of course, Littlefinger is currently plotting to marry Sansa to Harry Harding, uh, in order to gain control of the Vale. Uh, but that was under the assumption that Tyrion was about to be executed. But Tyrion was not executed, which means that uh, Sansa is not yet a widow. So I wonder if uh, the fact that Tyrion still lives might be an impediment to Littlefinger's plans. Uh, or maybe they'll just, you know, say that the marriage is annulled anyway. I don't know. But yeah, the, mari the, the, the relationship between Tyrion and Sansa, I think, will be relevant. And it might be part of this whole sort of uh, Stark-Lannister uh, alliance that might happen. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Adam, who says, could Tyrion have any children? If so, which characters are likely to be his children? I think if anyone is his child, it's probably Lana, who is the daughter of the, uh, the daughter of the, of the sailor's wife, uh, who might possibly be Tysha. Cause I mean, come on, her name is Lana. She has, she has blonde hair. Um, she might be a Lannister. It's also possible that she's Gary and Lannister's daughter, but you actually have to do some really fucky things with the timeline to make Gary and fit as the sailor's wife's husband. Um, it actually fits the timeline better for Tysha to be uh, the sailor's wife and for Lana to be Tyrion's daughter. The timeline actually works perfectly for that. Um, I'm still not like 100% sure that the Tysha, the Tysha is, the, is the sailor's wife. That might not be the case, but I think it's certainly possible. 
Um, thanks for the super chat from Braun, who says, So much bias and fallible, fallible perceptions in books, especially Lannister's. What's Tyrion's biggest lie to himself slash flawed perception of the world? That's an interesting question. I think that one example, one, one sort of flaw in his perception of the world is that he feels very hard done by uh, when he's actually very privileged. And we talk about this a bit in the video, because, like, Penny kind of kind of challenges Tyrion and says that, like, hey, like, you know, you have all these advantages that I don't have, and your pride is what led to your downfall, and you should just swallow your pride and be laughed at if that means that people are better off. But, but like, also... Also, uh, there's this line in book one where Tyrion thinks that, oh, you know, I'll make my own way in the world as I have all my life, as though he's like independent and he's struggling by himself. But but he says that while he is being accompanied by two men who serve him. He's got these two servants who do all of his cooking for him and guard him. Um uh, and, 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 that, and in the, in the same chapter, you know, he thinks that, you know, as befit a Lannister, I've got these two servants. And, and to me, that was just really striking as a way that Tyrion is almost delusional about like, I'm making my own way. Like I'm really toughing it out. I'm on my own, but he's a rich, he, he's a rich, he's like a rich playboy with like no responsibilities and as much money as he could possibly spend drinking wine, hanging out with sex workers. He's got servants to do all the work for him. And yet he's telling himself, he, I'll make my own way. And in Book, book three, he thinks that the birds always like to shit on him, especially as though he has a really hard life. So I, I think that's one of the ways in which Tyrion is, is almost sort of delusional in how he thinks he's got it really hard when he kind of doesn't. Um, uh, HCR Ompi says, is it possible that Tyrion knows Tysha and doesn't recognize her? Maybe she followed his life uh, and hates him for raping her. And maybe she's a wretch now. Um you're saying, like, maybe Tyrion has met Tysha, uh, but di didn't recognize Tysha and she hates him. Um, yeah, well, it might, it could make a lot of sense for Tysha to hate Tyrion, seeing as Tyrion did rape her. And it's really interesting that, like, George Martin said in an interview um, that one of... Uh, let, let me... Let me pull up the quote. Um, so, George Martin said that killing Shay was probably the blackest deed that Tyrion has ever done, along with what he did with his first wife by abandoning her after the little demonstration Lord Tywin put on. Uh, that's something that George Martin said in, a, in an interview. He said that one of the blackest deeds, one of the worst things Tyrion has done, was abandoning Tysha. And it's like that... That's interesting because that idea of Tyrion abandoning Tysha is not mentioned in the books, but like, I, I guess that's what happened. Like, I guess that after Tywin had Tysha gang raped and sent her away, Tyrion could have tried to find her or help her, but he didn't. And George Martin is saying that that was like a horrible thing that, that Tyrion did. So yeah, I mean, that adds to the idea that, yeah, maybe, maybe Tysha has good reason to resent Tyrion for how... Uh, he treated her and how he abandoned her after he found out that she was supposedly a whore. Um, so yeah, I think that's really interesting. There's something else about Tywin, by the by, is that uh, Duran Martell has this line where he says that Tywin died a cruel death at the hands of the monster that he himself begot. Which is true in the sense that, you know, like, like, like you know, Tywin was killed by his son Tyrion, but also like more deeply... Tywin was killed by Tyrion's brutality and and uh, his need for revenge and his spitefulness and and Tyrion was shaped into this like brutal pained angry person by Tywin's shitty parenting. It was Tywin's uh, horrible abuse of Tyrion that has made Tyrion into someone who wanted to kill Tywin and had the ruthlessness to do it. So like. So, you know, Duran's line sort of evokes the idea that Tywin's, Tywin's actions led to his own death because he was so horrible in how he raised Tyrion. Tywin almost destroyed himself by shaping Tyrion into a twisted image of himself, you know? It's almost self-destructive, you know? Like, Tywin and Tyrion recognize the similarity in each other, and so when Tyrion kills Tywin, it's almost an act of self-destruction. Trent says that I think Tyrion is a more embittered Tywin with much less to lose, and that is a scary thing indeed. I think Tywin was plenty bitter 
I think Tywin was very bitter, uh, but I certainly agree that uh, Tyrion has uh, very little to lose. Uh, Dopey Dragon says, will Tyrion ring up Timmet and the lads for Danny?" Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Uh, because Timmet, son of Timmet, is like low-key uh, an extremely cool character. Um, so in the, bo- in the show, we got this version of Timmet, son of Timmet. Um, he is one of the mountain clansmen uh, who uh, Tyrion recruits. Um, and he is like a, a, a scary dude because the burned men burn off parts of their body to show how cool and tough they are. Uh, and Timmet was, was such a crazy motherfucker that he burned out his own eye just to show he was tough. And someone who burns out their own eye to show that they're tough is a pretty scary dude. Um, and there's this whole thing about how Timmet might be the rightful Lord of the Eerie? Um, because there's this mention of how, like, one of the Aaron cousins was abducted by the mountain clansmen, by by the burned men specifically, I think. Um, and so there's this theory that maybe Timmet is the child of that woman, and that therefore, if the Aarons die out, then Timmet might actually be the closest thing to a rightful heir to the Vale. And Tyrion did promise that he would help the mountain clansmen take over the veil he said he'd, he would turn the veil into he would reduce the veil into a burning wasteland so yeah that is another thing that we didn't talk about in the video but Tyrion may indeed uh wage a campaign against the veil as he planned to do earlier uh with daenerys um and so maybe daenerys will remove the arons and install timot son of timot as lord of the veil i think that would be hilarious and there's actually some textual hints there you know it could work um, something else I wanted to say is that, uh, let me just get back to my notes, which is down here. So, so like something I wanted to say just generally about Tyrion in like being handed the king, um, is that he, he kind of does the worst possible thing. Like it's sort of a lose-lose situation because like Tyrion, uh, Tyrion himself got screwed over when he got accused of Joffrey's murder and got exiled and almost got killed. And the realm lost because Tyrion helped the Lannisters defeat Stannis. Like, it would have been better for the realm if Tyrion allowed the Lannisters to collapse, allowed Stannis to win. Because, you know, Stannis, for all his flaws, is a better ruler than Cersei bloody Lannister and Joffrey. Um, uh, But Tyrion also lost himself. So, So, like, I think that Tyrion's rule as the hand is basically a lose lose situation. If he just left Westeros, the realm would have been better off. Um, and he would have been better off, like, his whole, like, arc in A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords is, like, self-destructive, ultimately. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Hector, who says, Do you think Tyrion redemption arc is likely or possible? Is there any way it could be a satisfying conclusion for the character? Yeah, I sort of said that, like, I don't think it's going to be, like, you know, he's not going to be a good guy. He's not going to be loved by everyone. He's not going to be, like, unambiguously good. I think that there will be tragedy and there'll be evil and there'll be darkness alongside hope in Tyrion. And that's why I think an ending like being consigned to the Night's Watch makes sense. That could be, like, a tragic, sad thing, especially if he loses his tongue. I think there'll be darkness in there as well as light. Thanks for the donation from Nick, who says, Tyrion's parents are cousins, so it's completely likely for Tyrion to still have strong, inherent genetic similarity and dispositions to Tywin, even if he's a secret Targaryen. So I don't think the theory detracts from the relationship and story between them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, even if Tyrion is Aerys' son, he's still half Lannister. He's still half Joanna Lannister, and Joanna Lannister is pretty pretty genetically close to Tywin, I agree. I, I, I still am sympathetic to the argument that if Tyrion is not really Tywin's son, that does detract from the father-son relationship that Tywin and Tyrion has have. Like, genetics aside, I think there is some significance to fatherhood. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I think that is still relevant. Uh, something else I didn't mention in the video is the role of Garland Tyrell. So, uh, in the TV show, there's just Loras Tyrell and Marjorie Tyrell, but in the books, there's also Willis Tyrell uh, and Garland Tyrell. It's this whole colourful family, um, and there are hints that Willis and Garland will play a greater role later on in the books. 
Um, and Garland is a little bit significant to Tyrion's story because Tyrion, Garland says some nice things to Tyrion. Because, like, throughout Book 3, Tyrion feels really unappreciated because he, like, won the Battle of the Blackwater, but, like, no one thanks him for it. Tywin takes all the credit. But Garland is, like, the one guy who says, hey, I think Tyrion's a cool guy, and if it wasn't for Tyrion, we could have lost that battle. So, thanks, Tyrion. And, and Tyrion feels, quote, absurdly grateful um, f- to Garland for, for saying this nice thing to him. Um, so, it, so, so it's a just an, it's a nice illustration of like just how desperate for approval Tyrion is. And it's also a nice illustration of, hey, Garland is someone who exists um, and Garland is a super cool character. Who hopefully we'll see more from. Uh, also, like at Joffrey's wedding, like uh, Tyrion is really jealous of the happy couples who he sees at the wedding. Everywhere he looked, quote, everywhere he looked were women, fair, fine, beautiful, happy women who belonged to other men. And so I think that um, line illustrates how Tyrion is lonely and he's jealous in almost a sort of a vindictive way. Um, so that's another sort of interesting line that wasn't mentioned in the video. Um, another thing that we s- sort of could talk about in the video was like the role of Tyrion's relationship with the common people. Um, cause you know, the, the riot of King's Landing is one of, <laughs> I love, I love Joffrey's face here. Yeah. Uh, so the riot of King's Landing was one of the sort of big set pieces of, uh, book two. And you can argue that like the riot is like partly, uh, Tyrion's fault because like he failed to, uh, you know, manage the common folks relationship with the crown. Like you see how the Tyrells and Marjorie Tyrell does a really good job of making the common people love her and making them love the government uh, by, you know, like giving them stuff and hanging out and being seen by them. Whereas Tyrion does very little to improve the public relations with the common people. So you could sort of blame him for the riot is an argument you could make. Um, but, you know, like, like the riot largely happens because the people are hungry because there's no food in King's Landing. Um, and that's not really Tyrion's fault. And indeed, Tyrion does make efforts to feed the common people. Like he does try to bring food into King's Landing. So, so basically, like, I think that it's kind of ambivalent whether or not the riot is really Tyrion's fault. So that's why uh, we didn't really talk about it in the video. Thanks for the super chat from Cherie, who says, Why do you think Tyrion still identifies himself as a Lannister, even after his family's betrayal? Uh, good question. I mean, you know, given, yeah, given his family's betrayal, why wouldn't Tyrion want to embrace a new identity? Why wouldn't he want to become Hugo Hill? Why, why wouldn't he want to reject all of that? And I think the answer is that, like, as much as Tyrion hates Tywin, he recognizes that he's like Tywin. He compares himself to Tywin in his last chapter, and... He, and he recognizes that his Lannister identity is his strength. His Lannister identity is what gives him political power, it gives him gold, and, it, and his Lannister values of ruthlessness and revenge and, 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 and his politics, like, all of that is what makes Tyrion who he is. Like, Tyrion embraces his Lannister identity, the, the bad parts and the good parts, because that, that, that is who he is, you know? Um, and, and maybe if Tyrion was to sort of have a redemption arc, and if Tyrion was to try and be a better person, maybe that would involve rejecting his Lannister identity. And you could argue that maybe if Tyrion is a Targaryen, maybe embracing his Targaryen identity and rejecting his Lannister identity will be part of how he becomes a better person. Like he rejects being a Lannister who lives for vengeance and power, and he instead embraces being a Targaryen who fights the White Walkers and helps the righteous king and tries to do the right thing. Uh, that could be one, something that happens. Although I tend to think that Tyrion's Targaryen identity, insofar as he has a Targaryen identity, will be more about fire and blood, just like Daenerys is embracing fire and blood. Um, uh, another thing about Tyrion we didn't mention in the books is that, like, when Oberyn Martell rocks up, um, Tyrion has no interest in helping Oberyn get justice. Because the reason why Oberyn comes to King's Landing is that he wants to get justice or he wants to get revenge um, for the death of Elia Martell, who was killed by the Mountain, uh, who was working for Tywin. And Oberyn claims that Tywin ordered the Mountain to kill Elia as revenge uh, for Elia marrying Rhaegar instead of Cersei marrying Rhaegar. And so, like, there's all this... 
Like, like Tyrion said at the start of book two that he was going to do justice. And then in book three, Oberyn rocks up and he says, hey, I want justice. But Tyrion does not even consider trying to help Oberyn get justice. So that's just another example of how Tyrion doesn't give a fuck about justice. He's more interested in just protecting Lannister power. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Patrick, who says, conservative estimate on Wynn's release date. Uh, well, the optimistic release is tomorrow, and the conservative release date is uh, 2099. No one knows. George Martin doesn't know. No one knows when the book will come out, but I do hope it's soon. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Aiden, who says, Do you think that since Tyrion will push Danny to a darker path, that it's more likely that the Mad Queen plot would make more sense? I think Danny was supposed to be more than just another tyrant. Yeah, I mean, we kind of say that in the Tyrion video. Like, I think that... I think that King's Landing will burn, and I think that it will be partly Daenerys' fault. Um, but I think that Tyrion will be part of the equation, and that he might help convince Daenerys to burn King's Landing. Um, so yeah, I think that the... And, and, and I don't know if Mad Queen is, is what it's going to be about. Like, the TV show sort of leaned into this idea that Daenerys is mad, and that Targaryens have madness in their blood. Oh, I, I'm not so sure that that's what they're going to be doing in the books. I think it's going to be more complicated with the common people and John Con. We talk about it in the video. Thanks for the super chat from Chris Brown, who says, Finally caught a live stream. Just wanted to say that the All Tomorrow's video is one of the weirdest, horrifying, magnificent works of art. Uh, for Swift's eyes only, when is the crossover with Internet Historian? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I love All Tomorrow's very much, and I'm so happy that uh, the video was popular and that so many people are discovering the works of C.M. Kozeman, who is the writer of All Tomorrow's. Um, and I want to make more videos about more weird, horrifying, magnificent works of art, in your words. Um, I love A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, and I love The Expanse, and I love Westworld, and uh, there are also lots of other great stories that I'd love to share, um, especially obscure stories. Um, uh, like, you know, it's all well and good to talk about Game of Thrones when everyone knows about Game of Thrones, but it's a really cool feeling to uh, introduce an obscure story to a wider audience. Um, and now there's this whole wonderful fandom happening around All Tomorrow's. So you go on the All Tomorrow's subreddit, go on the All Tomorrow's fan videos on YouTube. There's amazing stuff being made. Um, so I'd love to make more videos about more weird art and more videos about nonfiction topics. Lots more stuff to make. Uh, H, H says, do you think Tyrion will push for Bran as king because he likes broken things and wants to vindictively ruin the system of government? That would be funny. Like, in the same way that Tyrion tells Aegon to go west, basically as a massive troll just to fuck with everyone. It'd be funny if he made if he made Bran king just because he's like, huh, it'd be funny if I made this psychic tree into the king. Like, that's gonna work. Um, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but it's a fun idea. Uh, I, I mean, so, something that I did want to say about, um, about Tyrion trolling and going west. Wait, what was I going to say about that? I forgot what I was going to say about that. Uh, there's so many things I want to say. Uh, Aiden says, thanks for the amazing vids you do. Thanks, Aiden. Toad Films says, what was Tyrion's relationship with Varys in the books? Uh, we sort of talked about that earlier. It, it, it's, it's, it's a complicated relationship. Like, Varys sort of helped Tyrion with, like, helping, with, like, hiding Shay. But Varys didn't help Tyrion politically as much as he could have. Um, and I think Varys was basically, like, scouting out, watching Tyrion, and eventually recruits Tyrion to support Varys' conspiracy behind Aegon. Um, so, yeah, it, it's sort of a complicated, ambiguous relationship in the books, but it's not even all that consequential, really, which is why we didn't talk about it all that much in the video. Thanks for the super chat from Neil and Lena, who says, sorry if you answered this already. What's your favorite unconfirmed fan theory? Um, I love the Blackfire theory, the theory that young Griff is not Aegon Targaryen, he's actually a Blackfire, and I like it because it adds a lot of richness and layers to the characters of Illyrio and Varys and Aegon. Uh, it fits the themes around power and illusions and sh a shadow on the wall. Um, and it connects to the Golden Company and the history of the Blackfires. Blackfire theory is super fucking cool and you can learn about it in the Old Shift X Varys video or the Old Shift X Blackfire Rebellions video. Uh, Der Courier says, what is north of the north of the north? Well, if we pull up the books, 
uh, we can look at the bit where uh, Bran has a vision of uh, the north of the north of the north, and he sees what he describes as the heart of winter. Uh, here it is. Finally, he looked north. He saw the wall. He saw Jon Snow. He saw past the wall, north and north and north. He looked to the curtain of light at the end of the world, and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and his tears burned on his cheeks. That is what's north of the north of north of north of north. And uh, what is that? What is the heart of winter? Maybe it's connected to the Great Other, which Melisandre seems to think is like this dark god associated with the White Walkers. Um, maybe it's connected to the heart of darkness that's described uh, as being in Stigai. Uh, there's this place called Stigai, which is near Ashai, and it's this like nuclear fucking wasteland that seems to have been the site of some kind of magical disaster that may have destroyed a shy which may once have been the capital of the great empire of the dawn it's a whole thing we'll talk about it in a video sometime um but yeah maybe it's some kind of locus of magical power and maybe in order to defeat the white walkers once and for all uh john as the last hero needs to travel out beyond the far north and destroy um, whatever the heart of winter is, and maybe that'll destroy the power of the White Walkers. Um, the, 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 there was that tree in, uh, the Game of Thrones TV show where the White Walkers were created, um, and I wonder if that tree might represent or be connected to the heart of winter, you know? Maybe that it has some equivalent in the books? I'm not sure. Uh, Dan says, what tastes better, Kis Giscari puppy stew or Frey pie? I think you should combine them, you should combine them both. Like, bring together the culinary styles of the, of the North and of, uh, Old Geese, uh, to make a, a, <laughs> a pie made of both human meat and puppy meat. Wyman Mandalay would love it, I guarantee. Thanks for the super chat from Colin, who says, is Pod alive? Pod is alive. Uh, Podrick is young uh, in the books. Uh, he's hanging out with Brienne. Uh, and Brienne and Podrick get captured by Lady Stoneheart, who is the resurrected corpse of, uh, of Catelyn Stark. Um, and Catelyn Stark starts to hang and execute Brienne and Pod. Uh, but then Brienne uh, says sword, which represents her decision to help Catelyn Stark capture Jaime in return for Brienne and Podrick's lives. Uh, so Brienne uh, tells Jaime to come with her uh, to Lady Stoneheart, uh, which is going to be a very interesting confrontation uh, early in the Winds of Winter. So yes, Pod is alive. Pod the Rod, Pod the God is alive. Uh, I also want to say that it's quite interesting that I should know, I'll skip that bit. I will say that there is a bit where Tyrion falls into the River Rhoyne. When they get attacked uh, by stone men, uh, Tyrion gets pulled into the water uh, by the stone men, um, and he gets saved by Jon Con. But like for a moment, it looks like he's drowned, uh, because when he comes out of the water, he's cold as ice, and it seems like he might be dead. Um, but then he sort of miraculously... Uh, comes back and he's revived after drowning, which is like a, which is like this surprising thing in the books, and that's really similar to the whole Ironborn custom of people being drowned and then resuscitated. What is dead may never die, and the drowned god resurrects people. Uh, and so there are people who have theories about this. Like there are people who say that oh well maybe Tyrion actually died, but he was resurrected by the power of the drowned god, or by the power of the old gods, or the, or the magic of the Ruin, or the magic of the shrouded lord. There are people who have theories about like the reason why Tyrion didn't contract grayscale is because the shrouded lord is Gary and Lannister, and Gary and likes him, so he didn't give him grayscale. All sorts of interesting theories there. Uh, none of which I think are likely, but hey, it's interesting. Um, oh yeah, it was, it's, it's, yeah, something I wanted to say about like, you know, like when Tyrion is trolling Aegon and sending him west uh, in order to just like fuck with their plans and create chaos, uh, he's almost like Littlefinger. Like Tyrion becomes similar to Littlefinger, someone who uses his words and his lies to manipulate people and create chaos and violence. Uh, um, like Tyrion almost becomes like a littler little finger, uh, which I think is fun. But uh, yeah, 
Um, something else that's 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 interesting is like you know any sort of relationship with Penny. Um, one of the sort of sad things is that like Penny has this dog and this pig who are like her best friends in the world. Um, and when they get taken as slaves, the, the dog and the pig get taken as well. And when they escape slavery, Penny wants to save Pretty Pig and Crunch as well. Those are the names of the pig and the dog. Uh, but Tyrion leaves them behind and Penny is really upset that, that her best friends, this pig and this dog, uh, uh, are lost to her and uh the dog crunch apparently gets killed uh, and pretty pig uh, is uh, mia i can't believe we're talking about <laughs> the lives of pigs and dogs in this specificity but my point is that like Tyrion's decision to leave those animals behind is like another example of him rejecting penny's optimism and choosing like a sort of ruthlessness instead but one of the other interesting things about penny is that you know, she talks about her life and how she's performed as as a mama, as a performer all over the East. And he once before, and she and her brother once performed for the Sea Lord of Bravos, the ruler of Bravos. And the ruler of Bravos laughed so hard that afterward he gave each of us a dot 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 a grand gift. But she doesn't say what that grand gift is. So it's just this sort of little interesting, intriguing mystery. What is the grand gift? that the Sea Lord of Bravos gave to Penny and Oppo. Um, the sort of dot, dot, dot makes me think that it's something ominous, that it's something bad that the Sea Lord did to Penny and Oppo, but it hasn't been revealed yet, and so I wonder if that will be revealed later on. Thanks for the super chat from Counterpart, who says, Do you think there will be a history book like Fire and Blood that takes place after the series, given George Martin ever gets that far? It would probably be... It would probably be the book of Bran's tax policies. <laughs> yeah, because George Martin has said that, like, you know, he loves the Lord of the Rings, but the Lord of the Rings didn't get into enough nitty gritty detail. Like, they said that Aragorn became king and he ruled just and justly and wisely for hundreds of years. But, like, what, were, what was his tax policy? What did he do with all the orcs? Did Aragorn hunt down and murder all of the orcs in a genocidal campaign? Like, those are some of the hard questions that George Martin wants to ask about A Song of Ice and Fire. And that's why there's so much sort of darkness and complexity and politics going on in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, I don't think that George will write a story after A Song of Ice and Fire. I, I don't think that would add to things. I mean, George Martin is certainly interested in the prehistory. Like, I, like, like, George Martin, the next project after A Song of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood is the Duncan Egg stories. He's written three prequel stories about Duncan Egg set 100 years before A Song of Ice and Fire, and he wants to write as many as 10 or 12 of those stories. So I think he'll, I think that, I hope that is what he'll be doing after A Song of Ice and Fire. If indeed, fingers crossed, he uh, writes uh, a bunch more Westeros stories after A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, Jan says, was young Griff a plan since the start of A Song of Ice and Fire? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, um, yeah, I believe he was because young Griff was raised by like John Con and all the people in the Shine Maid for years. And that's all part of Illyrio and Varys' plan. So, yeah, we're not given many details, but, yeah, it, it, it was since the start of A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, the Golden Company have been in on it for a while, because it was uh, Miles Blackheart Toyne uh, who made a deal with Illyrio and co. Uh, back in the day, and that was years back. So, yeah, the, the Aegon Varys Illyrio conspiracy has been a long time in the works. Um Another thing that I wanted to say was that Tyrion sails past Valyria uh, in the sh in the in the books. In the show, he and Jorah have this weird road trip where they go through Valyria, um, but that's that that's not nothing like that in the books. Valyria is a much scarier place. Uh, Valyria is is a cursed wasteland, um, and it's very spooky and magical. Um, and when Tyrion goes past Valyria in the books, he thinks that it's, it, it was, it, he, he thinks an empire built on blood and fire, the Valyrians reaped the seed they had sown. Um, which is interesting in terms of like, you know, it, it, it's about the fiery destruction that the Valyrians suffered 
for their crimes. You know, it's almost like a morality tale, like Atlantis, you know, the Empire of Atlantis that in some tellings became like immoral. And so the island sank beneath the sea and like Numenor in the Lord of the Rings and Numenorians became corrupt and evil. And so Numenor was lost beneath the sea. Valyria is a similar thing. These powerful people turned evil and their empire was destroyed. And that whole sort of like fiery wasteland, like, you know, and, and, and also Tyrion sees along the Rhoyne, he sees the destruction of the sorrows, which was caused by the dragon lords of Valyria. So, so Tyrion gets like a, a grand tour of all the places and all the destruction that's been wrought by Valyrian dragon lords. And you might think that, well, hey, maybe Tyrion, after seeing the destruction caused by dragon lords, will choose not to encourage Daenerys' violent tendencies, you know? Because the whole Valyria, the ruins of Valyria, the ruins of the Rhoyne, are the perfect, like, uh, metaphor, perfect illustration of why you shouldn't go ham on a dragon. You shouldn't go around burning everything. Um, But, you know, sort of the flip side of that is that, well, maybe the destruction of Valyria and all these ruins will actually just inspire Tyrion to cause more destruction and create more wastelands, to turn Westeros into a waste just like Valyria now is. Those are two sort of directions you could go with that, with with his uh, with his looking at Valyria. uh, in the video, I sort of was tempted to compare Daenerys's exit from Slaver's Bay with uh, the recent uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, of the United States, but decided not to say that because people don't want to hear about real world politics in a Song of Ice and Fire videos. Um, we, oh, something else I wanted to talk about was like, so, so we talk about how the sailor's wife uh, might be Taisha and that it's possible that uh, Tyrion will reunite with, with his wife who he had loved. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, the sailor's wife is in Bravos, and in Bravos there is that play um, where there's a version of Tyrion uh, that Arya sees this play. Arya, Arya is in this play uh, in the books that ha- that is about Tyrion, and it's about how Tyrion is an evil villain. And I wonder that if Taisha is the sailor's wife, I wonder if she could have seen this play, The Bloody Hand, and I wonder if Taisha could have seen uh, the supposed crimes of her of her first husband, and I wonder how she might have how she might feel about that. That'd be really crazy if Taisha saw the Bloody Hand play. Uh, something else I sort of wanted to do in the video was um, so we talk about how like when when Tyrion uh, when Tyrion is saved by Jaime. Um, and when Tyrion farewells Jamie, that's like the moment where Tyrion and where Tyrion becomes a different character in the books compared to the show. Uh, because in the books, uh, Tyrion finds out about Tysha and he's angry at Jamie. Uh, and that's like the moment when Tyrion kind of becomes a boring character in the show, honestly. And so I sort of wanted to make, make this like a, 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 fuck, I wanted to make this a Simpsons reference. Um, when Bart's like, you can see the actual moment when Ralph Wiggum's heart breaks. And I wanted to go, you can see the actual moment when Tyrion becomes a boring character in Game of Thrones, uh, with that scene. But, you know, I decided it wasn't funny enough to include in the video. Um, another interesting thing is that in the books, Quaith, uh, Quaith warns Daenerys about the perfumed Seneschal. And... Perfumed Seneschal could mean a lot of different things, but Tyrion thinks, oh, maybe that could mean... Well, no, Tyrion doesn't think, but Tyrion does ride a ship called the Selasori Koran, uh, which is translated as the Stinky Steward. Tyrion says it means the Stinky Steward, and Stinky Steward means the same thing as Perfumed Seneschal. So maybe Quaith's warning about the Perfumed Seneschal refers to uh, the ship that Tyrion is on. And I wonder if maybe the reason why Quaith is warning Daenerys about this ship is that this ship carries Tyrion, and Tyrion will encourage Daenerys to burn King's Landing, and Tyrion will be a terrible influence on Daenerys. So maybe that's why Quaith is warning Daenerys against Tyrion. I think that's a interesting, legitimate interpretation of that warning. Um... I think that Euron, like, Euron is doing all this, like, eldritch, apocalypse, sorceress, crazy shit in the books, um, and I think it's possible that Euron, a lot of people think it's possible that Euron might, uh, well, he is attacking Old Town, or it looks like he's about to attack the city of Old Town, and Old Town is where the Citadel is, where the Maesters are from, uh, with the big library of the Citadel, 
And Tyrion is a big lover of books. Um, and we speculate in the video that maybe Tyrion might become like the Night's Watch librarian at the end of the books. I think another possibility is that if Euron like destroys or attacks the Citadel at Old Town uh, or ransacks it, maybe Tyrion at the end of the books will try to rebuild the library at the Citadel. And maybe his role will be to spend time with the books. And because like, like in, like he thinks about all these rare books that he loves and these rare books that he'd like to find, just like Sam was really excited to be at the Citadel library. I think Tyrion would be really excited to be there too. So maybe after, and you know, you, you know, we speculate that maybe Euron will cut out Tyrion's tongue. We speculate that Euron might uh, take uh, Tyrion's dragon Viserion uh, and maybe after Euron destroys the, the Citadel, Tyrion will rebuild it and become someone who looks after books. I think that's another cool possibility for Tyrion's endgame. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Roan, who says, I'm a big fan, really like the way you present your videos. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Melonkopf, who says, you skipped mine and... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed some super chats. We're going to have to wrap up soon. I'm trying my best to answer as many super chats as possible. Rich says, will Tyrion survive in the books? Yeah, I think Tyrion will survive in the books. Um, in the original 1993 outline that George Martin wrote, uh, he said that there are, uh, th there are a bunch of characters who will, yeah, here we are. Here it is right here. Five central characters will make it through all three volumes growing from children to adults and changing the world and themselves in the process. And those five characters are Tyrion, Daenerys, Arya, Bran, and Jon Snow. So according to the 1993 outline, all of those characters will survive to the end of the story. Of course, the story that he wrote is now very different to this original outline. Um, Tyrion is no longer in a love triangle with Arya and Jon Snow, for example, and Catelyn was not killed by White Walkers. There's a lot of differences. Uh, but at least, you know, according to that, uh, Tyrion may survive. And I think Tyrion probably will survive, but he, he might survive in a very tragic way, like if his tongue is cut out. Alex says, uh, ever think about making a vid on Jamie? We have, make an, we have made a video about Jamie, and I think it's a pretty good video. So you can check it out on Alt Shift X. There is a video called Kingslayer, and it's about Jamie's arc. Thanks for the super chat from Plastic, who says, are you a Gene Wolf fan? Uh, I... I'm not familiar with the works of Gene Wolfe. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to say, we're going to wrap up real soon. So if you've got any burning questions, chuck them in the live chat. Um, one last thing I want to say is that there is a theory that Tyrion is a genetic chimera. So like the, there's, there's the idea that, you know, maybe Tyrion is not the son of Tywin Lannister. He's actually the son of Aerys Targaryen. Um, some truly uh, galaxy brained individuals have theorized that Tyrion is not just the son of Tywin and not just the son of Aerys. He is the son of both Aerys Targaryen and Tywin Lannister and Joanna Lannister. The idea being that uh, the sperm of like, like the idea that jo <laughs> the idea is that joanna had sex with both aries and tywin around the same time and that and that sperm from both aries and tywin uh uh fertilized an egg inside joanna and that these two fertilized embryos were somehow merged like they were they, they were like twins but they like merged together and appa apparently this is a thing like there's a wikipedia article on genetic chimerism it is a thing that sometimes two different fertilized embryos can become one combined person and so the theory is that maybe that happened in a song of ice and fire maybe Tyrion is actually the son of both tywin and Ares and Joanna, and so he has both like Lannister and Targaryen characteristics, which to me is unnecessary because if Tyrion is the son of Joanna Lannister and Ares Targaryen, he's already half Lannister, half Targaryen. So making him a genetic chimera does not make him. He's just also, he's just still Lannister and Targaryen. Like I don't see the point of him being a genetic chimera, but hey, it is a fun idea that that some people really like. Um, and, and, you know, like, like, you know, but like there is some chimerism going on with Tyrion. Like, it's interesting that he has heterochromia, one green eye, one black eye. Uh, maybe there is something chimeric about that. Like he's a combination of different things. Uh, yeah, there, there, there's something there. Um, oh, also, uh, I want to answer, uh, this question by Monty, uh, who is a Patreon supporter. Uh, and Monty says, do you think Tyrion deserves a happy ending? Like, you know, will he, 
you know, live happily after ever, but something bittersweet. Will he get a bittersweet ending or does he deserve it? Does he deserve our sympathy? And, and you know, like, as I sort of said at the start, like, you know, part of why I think Tyrion is such a great character is that he elicits so many different reactions and opinions. Some people really love um, Tyrion. Some people really hate him. Some people think he's a villain. Some people think he's a hero. And he, he is all of those things, which, which I love that. Um, I love how subjective he is. Um, and... Like, personally, I, I, I want a happy ending for everyone, uh, phrasing. Um, I, w- I want everyone to be better off and to grow into a healthier person and to, and to get... I, I, want, I want everyone to have a happy ending. Um, but I don't think that Tyrion will, because I think that George Martin is writing a tragedy as much as anything. Um, and I think there'll be hope, but I think there'll also be a lot of bitterness and a lot of horrible things that'll happen to Tyrion. So, so, so you know, I, I still think that, as we said in the video, I think Tyrion losing his tongue and becoming, like, on the Night's Watch or something is an appropriate amount of tragedy, but also, like, a glimmer of hope if he also, like, helps save the world from the White Walkers. So, you know, I, I, I wish the best on everyone, even fictional characters. Um... Yeah, thanks for the super chat from Johnny, who says, when the Winds of Winter comes out, have you thought about how long you'll wait until you start making videos about it? Johnny, I will not wait. I will read the Winds of Winter, uh, and I will make many videos about it. Uh, There is no question about that. Uh, Thanks for the super chat from Cherie, who says, do you think Tyrion needs to lose his tongue given his dwarfism? Jamie and Cersei lost their hand and their looks because they're otherwise perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, we sort of talk about that in the video that Tyrion has sort of already suffered his downfall. So does he need to lose his tongue when he's sort of already become a slave and lost his nose and lost his power? So maybe losing his tongue is sort of an unnecessary addition to the story. Like, I think that's a reasonable argument. Um, but I also think that him losing his tongue is something that there's a lot of hints for it. And it could add a really tragic dimension to the end of his story. Okay, we're going to end the live stream now. We've been talking for three hours straight about Tyrion Lannister. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, this live stream, it'll be unlisted from YouTube for the moment, but we're going to put up an edited version on the Old Chief Dex podcast, I think. Uh, so go and subscribe to the Old Chief Dex podcast. There's a link in the description. Um, and in the meantime, it'll be unlisted for Patreon supporters. Uh, there's a link to the Patreon in the description. Um, but thank you all so much for watching the Tyrion video. Thank you so much for this stream. Thank you all for the super chats. I apologize, uh, for the super chats I didn't get to. That's a couple more. I'll answer really quickly right now. Game Inspection says, would you like to see a full animated Game of Thrones adaptation of each book? Of course I would. I would love to see that. And maybe that will happen. Maybe maybe decades from now we'll get a animated adaptation of the Song of Ice and Fire books. I think that would be awesome. I would love to visualize a lot of this book-only stuff. Omega says, if you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. Yeah, well, that was the one thing that the show got right, is that uh, this is not a happy story. All right. Thank you guys so much. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. Uh, check out the podcast, check out our other videos. Like if you're interested in the Blackfires and the Lannisters, like we've we've got videos on all that stuff. So go check it out. Um, yeah, drink water, eat veggies, call your mum. See ya.